Good afternoon and welcome to the members of the viewing and listening public, to the officials of the Ministry of Health and of the Northwest Regional Health Authority, the North Central Regional Health Authority, the Eastern Regional Health Authority and the Southwest Regional Health Authority and members of the media. I am Bridget Anizet George, the Chairman of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee of the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The Committee on the Public Administration and Appropriations, the PAAC, has the mandate to consider and report to the House on A, the budgetary expenditure of government agencies to ensure that expenditure is embarked upon in accordance with parliamentary approval. B, the budgetary expenditure of government agencies as it occurs and keeps parliament informed of how the budget allocation is being implemented. And C, the administration of government agencies to determine hindrances to their efficiency and to make recommendations to the government for improvement of public administration. The purpose of this meeting is to examine the accessibility and availability of diagnostic imaging services at public health institutions with specific reference to the regional health authorities under the purview of the Ministry of Health. The role of the committee is to assist the stakeholders in achieving the efficient delivery of services while ensuring that expenditures embarked upon in accordance with parliamentary approval. To determine the challenges being faced and possible solutions to these challenges and to make recommendations for improvement of public administration. This meeting is being broadcast live on the Parliament's Channel 11, on Radio 105.5 FM, and on the Parliament's YouTube channel, Pearl View. Participants are kindly advised that their microphone should remain muted until recognized by the chair. I therefore now invite the members of the committee to introduce themselves and then followed by the officials of the Ministry of Health and following the officials of the regional health authorities. So might I invite the members of the committee to begin. Good Hi, afternoon, good afternoon. everyone. <laughs> 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 good afternoon, everyone. You're Kima Bethelmi, member. Hi, member Bodo. Stephen McCrashy, member. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Lakram Bodo, Vice Chairman. Welcome to everyone. Thank you very much. And therefore, may I ask the officials of the Ministry of Health to introduce themselves, starting with the Permanent Secretary. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Asif Ali, Acting Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melanie Noel, Acting Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Health. Hi, good afternoon, Chair and Members. I'm Dr. Roshan Paraswam, Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health. Um, I believe we still have Mr. Taylor and Mr. Smith. Good, uh, good afternoon. Go ahead. Good afternoon, members. Uh, my name is Paul Taylor. I'm a biomedical engineer consultant to the Ministry of Health. Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Stuart Smith, Health Systems Advisor, Ministry of Health. Thank you very much. Can we go on to the Eastern Regional Health Authority? Beginning with the Chief Executive Officer. All right, uh, greetings and salutations to everyone. Ronald Soyafat, CEO, Eastern Regional Health Authority. Is the Acting Medical Director there? Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Sasha Sankamaraj, Acting Medical Director, Sandy Grandi Hospital. Is the County Medical Officer of Health there? Good afternoon, everyone. Alana Best, Acting County Medical Officer of Health. Is the Acting Manager, 
Paraclinical Services here with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Sala Bisasa, Acting Manager of Paraclinical Services, Eastern Regional Health Authority. And what about the Commissioning Manager? Good afternoon, everyone. Amy Ali, Commissioning Manager for the New Sally Bradley Hospital. Thank you very much. May I now invite the officials from the North Central Regional Health Authority, starting with Chief Executive Officer. Good afternoon, everyone. Davlin Thomas, CEO of the North Central Regional Health Authority. And do we have the Director of Health, the Acting Director of Health? Good afternoon, Dr. Malakai Ojuro, Director of Health, NCRHA. Okay, and the Chief Operating Officer. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacey Thomas Lewis, Chief Operating Officer, NCRHA. And we have the Regional Coordinator, Radiology Services. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shanti Mongru. I'm the Regional Coordinator of Radiology Services for the NCRG. And I believe we should have with us the Manager of Information Systems and Information Technology. Hi, good afternoon, all. My name is Anil Lachman, Manager IT of North Central Regional Health Authority. Thank you very much. Can I now invite the officials from the Northwest Regional Health Authority? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Sully Shabash, Acting Chief Executive Officer of NWRHA. The Head of Radiology, is he with us? Yes, Dr. Anil Budram, Acting Head of Radiology. Thank you. And the Acting Manager, Policy and Planning. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shamaya Walcott, Acting Manager, Policy and Planning, NWRG. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, can I invite the officials from the Southwest Regional Health Authority, starting with ECU. Good afternoon, one and all. I'm Dr. Brian Amo, Chief Executive Officer, Southwest Regional Health Authority. Do we have the Chief Operation Officer joining us today? Okay, uh, do we have the Director of Health? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Pravin Ramuta, Director of Health, Socrates RG. And do we have the Head of the Department, Radiology? Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Anthony Amiral, Head of the Department of Radiology, Southwest Regional Health. Thank you very much to all. And uh, I therefore will, in, I'll therefore invite the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health to make a brief opening statement, if he so wishes. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my colleagues from the Ministry of Health and the Regional Health Authorities, um, members of the viewing and listening public. Diagnostic imaging which can be both invasive and non-invasive, is but one component used by our physicians and healthcare professionals to detect, analyze, and assess patients in determining and confirming the cause of an injury, illness, or disease condition. These images that are produced are reviewed and interpreted by our specialist physicians to make diagnoses that will allow the medical practitioner to develop appropriate treatment plans for the disease or medical condition with a view to a successful patient outcome. In this regard, our public health sector has made significant strides in the last 10 years with respect to the provision of diagnostic equipment and services. These include CT scans, MRIs, ultrasound, mammograms, general x-ray, mobile x-ray services, fluoroscopy, echocardiogram. This has enabled the public sector to build its capacity in the provision of key diagnostic imaging services for, for meeting the ongoing needs of our population. The ministry and more specifically, our RHAs will continue to undertake the required preventive and where necessary corrective maintenance, as well as replacement of equipment as needed. Um, Madam Chair, before I end, I, I would like to just touch on the greatest health challenge we are facing right now, COVID-19 pandemic, a global pandemic. While the pandemic has affected health systems across the globe, and by extension, the business of health services delivery, 
all our healthcare workers have demonstrated resilience, robustness, and agility needed at this time. And I felt the need to acknowledge this. The ministry looks forward to today's proceedings as we examine the provision of diagnostic imaging services in the public sector and welcome the, the ensuing conversation with suggestions and recommendations for improved service as we go forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Permanent Secretary. And um, I, I welcome you setting out from the outset what types of equipment come under this terminology of diagnostic imaging. Because of course, members of the public will be more familiar with the, with the term CT scan and MRIs, um, you know, rather than um, ultrasounds, rather than the terminology that we use, which is all embracing. And therefore, you know, to put the conversation in, in some sort of context, I, I have seen that um, all of the RHEs in their um, mission statement or their objectives, and even permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health, one talks about providing quality, safe, and cost-effective health services to the community that is served. You know, the terminology may differ a bit, but it's generally like that. And therefore, I want to ask, um, and I throw this out to the CEOs of each regional corporate, um, regional health authority, with regards to providing the diagnostic imaging services, would they say that they are meeting the, the goal of providing quality, safe, and cost-effective services? So I'd, I'd first ask the question to the um, permanent secretary, because you all have the overall um, position of um, managing and, and, and ensuring that, they're, that the, um, regional, the regional health authorities meet the objectives. So I'll ask from the Ministry of Health perspective, and then I'd ask each CEO to give their response to that question. Sure, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, to answer your question in brief, yes, I think we are. These are the quality of the service we provide. There is yes, quality control both at the level of the respective RHAs and at the ministries, and also in terms of the quality of the diagnostic scans and the imaging that are done across the sector. So, in terms of quality, yes. Cost effective, that is, um, you can always do better. Um, so, yes, it's cost effective, but we are const constantly looking at ways that we can manage that cost. One of those ways is by maximizing the use of technology, where we, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit about it a little later on, PAX, which is where you use digital imaging. So you no longer print the um, your, your x-rays on, on film, but you can read it on the computer. And, and that allows for, for faster diagnosis and, and maximization of the human resource. So, so I do think we are, we are on that path. Thank you. Thank you. And May I therefore ask the CEO of the Northwest Regional Health Authority, in terms of her authority, um, what is her position in terms of meeting that sort of cost-effective quality health service as far as diagnostic imaging in terms of the cohort catchment that you serve? Thank you, Madam Chair, for the question and for the opportunity to respond. Um, with respect to the Northwest Regional Health Authority, um, it would be similar to what the PS would have alluded to. We do try our best to manage our, our cost with respect to different services. Um, and that entail would be um, encompassing our different service contracts for the different um, pieces of equipment that we do have. And with respect to equipment that we don't and we have to outsource services, we do enter into negotiations with service providers to try and get the best price possible for whatever service we are outsourcing. So there's always room for improvement and we continue to try and improve, you know, as we move along. Okay, and thank you very much. Um, might I now call on the CEO of the North Central Regional Health Authority? 
Chairman, similar to what the the um, the the PS would have indicated, and my colleague from the Northwest, we we engage to ensure that we get the best possible. Okay, so I think we may have lost Mr. Thomas. So when he gets back his connectivity, we'll allow him to respond. Maybe we could go on to the CEO of the Eastern Regional Health Authority, Mr. Soyafat. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I just can refer to perhaps our uh, client feedback surveys when one looks at um, the quality of service that we are trying to you know, ensure that our clients have. Uh, our current client feedback survey indicates that we are between 80 and 90% giving that satisfaction. And this is an indication for us as to where we have to look for areas to improve and so on. Um, as far as diagnostic imaging would be concerned, um, our waiting times are fairly within uh, standards, all right? And uh, our limitations would be that we currently, for example, do not have MRI services um, so that we, and fluoroscopic services, so that we rely upon um, the other regional health authorities to back us up in those services. And I must say that the quality of the backup is quite uh, acceptable, so that um, we think that we are doing a fairly good job at this point in time. And as I said, this is borne out by the level of uh, feedback that we get in our client service. Thank you. And might I now call on the CEO of the Southwest Regional Health Authority. Thank you, Chair. Um, like the Permanent Secretary and my other colleague CEOs, I would say overall that the Southwest Regional Health Authority is fairly cost effective with the resources given to us. We are a fairly large RHA and that um, in terms of the quality and safety and um, keeping our vision and mission statements, I believe in large measure we fulfill it in terms of we do have quality staff, we do have the architecture of the equipment in the various tiers of the facilities. Um, the reports um, that is before the committee would show that overall all our inpatients and emergency procedures are appropriately managed, which again brings in quality, safety and cost effectiveness. Um, yes, there are a couple of challenges uh, with the relative demand versus the service for a couple of the outpatient um, popular tests, as you said, people know as CT scan and MRI. Um, but in terms of all the other diagnostics and even on the outpatient setting, it's, it's fairly um, reasonable. So there's always room for improvement, yes. Um, but in terms of given the, the financial allocation, the human resources, the architect of the equipment, I think that SOUTAS overall is, is pretty well above threshold and um, subject to the discussions and observations of the committee. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I, I just wanted to ask this in terms of uh, and to, to you, the um, PS and the Ministry of Health, I see that, and we'll go down, we'll go into the, the breakdown of the equipment, but I see that each regional health authority, of course, has its geographic limits and its population catchment. And seeing that you, you in your mission statement, you will talk about um, evidence-based, policy making, um, planning, and monitoring. I was wondering in terms of what sorts of factors are taken into account to match the population of an RHA versus the, um, the equipment that they have. So that I, I see like, for instance, Northwest Regional Health say that their population size is about 500,000 persons. I don't know what informs that, but that's what I, I, I see. Whereas Southwest so Regional you, Health. Excuse me? Yes, and whereas I'm seeing, like, say, Southwest Regional Health Authority has a population catchment of about 600,000. Yet the equipment varies in quantity and type. What therefore informs 
who gets what type of equipment and the quantity per type for the regional health authorities. Sure, thank, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so there, are, there are multiple factors that we look at, one of which you mentioned would have been the population. But in addition to the population would be the, the burden of disease. So for example, you might have um, a higher prevalence of a particular condition or disease in a particular geographic area. Notwithstanding, the population might not be as large as another. So, so you look at, at the burden of disease geographically. The other thing to consider is that we do have universal access. So although someone lives in um, San Fernando, they might work in Port of Spain. So you have you can access healthcare anywhere in the public sector. We are not zoned, there is universal access. So persons are free to access service wherever they wish, which is why what the ministry does, we, we try to adopt um, a more bottoms up approach in terms of that planning, where we use the data coming from the RHAs in terms of they would look at, at, at all those factors that I spoke about and make recommendations to the ministry as part of the budgeting cycle in terms of based on a particular demand, disease burden, they would propose that they purchase a particular piece of equipment. There'd be that conversation with the ministry where we would validate that, that information. And then we put forward that, that recommendation in terms of the Ministry of Finance for funding to, to, um, to acquire that equipment. There might be cases where because of, um, let's, let's say, the expertise and, and, and the type of facilities that we have, you might want to centralize that equipment Initially, so MRIs, for example, when you started years ago, there would have been just one MRI in the country because the infrastructure to support an MRI would not have been sufficient across the country. We've now started to, to um, implement MRIs at the different RHAs. So those are some things that we would look at in determining or having that conversation, what equipment is placed in which RHA and in which facility within the RHAs. But, but it's more a bottom up approach because the Irishes have the data. They are the ones on the ground getting that 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 demand from the population. Okay, so basically then I if I understand you well, the population size of every RHA is in reality 1.4 and not five hundred thousand or six six hundred thousand. Is that what you're saying? So if one lived in Digo Martin, one could go to Southwest without being referred from say Karanaj Health Center. One could just pick up and drive from Bigo Martin and go to Southwest Regional Health and access services. Is that is that understanding correct? Um, and so in case of emergency, yes, if you have an emergency. So you, let's say you're vacationing in Mayaro and you live in Bigo Martin and you have an emergency. Yes, you can access care there afterwards. I, and I will let my RHA speak a bit more about the clinical part of it. I don't want to no, no, but the scenario, Mr. Ali, with all respect, the, the, the scenario I painted was not if I were vacationing in, right. in Miaro and right. I fell ill. I'm saying I'm living in Diego Martin. Mm -hmm. And my choice is because, well, I hear that um, Southwest Rail Good, I can, whether it is that I can drive from Diego Martin right. and access services in Southwest. It was very so, specific. Okay, sure. So, short answer, yes, yeah, but I have, to, I have to qualify that answer. So for a, a test, for example, an MRI, you just can't walk in and say, I want an MRI. You must have a doctor's referral. All right. So there has to be an initial conversation, that interaction with a healthcare professional first before you, you seek to access a diagnostic service. But if you're talking healthcare generally, answer to you is yes. Yes. So I, I am living in Diego Martin. I have a doctor's referral. Right. I can drive to Southwest an institution in Southwest and get my MRI. That's what you're saying. That is the comfortable universal access, yes. Okay. All right. So I, I therefore, at this stage, want to maybe invite Dr. Bodo to join the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And again, a good afternoon to uh, officials from the Ministry of Health and the regional health authorities. I want to Thank you for taking the time to join us in the midst of this pandemic. I know that you're all very much under pressure. And I want to wish you well and urge you to stay strong in the battle as we go forward. Um, I just wanted to, to um, base my first question really on the response um, that was submitted in response to the question of the list of equipment 
he used to provide diagnostic imaging services that would have been in the submission to this committee. Um, so I, I looked at the four RHAs and the response came in different formats. So I, I just wanted to ask a bit about that, but also to, I, I know the question was very specific in terms of a list of the equipment and the frequency of use, but I do want to commend the Northwest RHA in terms of going further and providing a bit more information, which I think would be useful and I say that because in the grand scheme of things, the age of diagnostic equipment, I'm sure CEOs and my clinical colleagues will agree, the age of the equipment is very important in terms of providing service and maintenance costs and so on. Um, so there's a very useful um, column with the NWRHA, um, which says when the equipment was installed and so on, and the service contracts, um, that are available. So my question is this, um, whether we can ask in, for, in writing whether the other RHAs can provide the, that would be the NCRHA, the ERHA, and the SWRHA can provide in writing a similar information in terms of the, um, when the equipment was installed or procured. And therefore that will give us a better idea of the age of the particular equipment. Um, before I leave this appendix, Madam Chair, I also want to ask two specific questions with regards to, so if, can, I, can I ask that first question um, be sent out to the RHG for that information? In writing, I don't think it can be provided at this meeting unless it can be provided. I, I think it'll be too, too much. And I think you're correct, Member Bodo, that that should come in writing. It will yes. take up just too much of the the precious time as relevant as it is. Sure. Um, so the second point with regards to the submission by SWRHA, I just want to draw the attention of the um, CEO, my colleague, Dr. Amor, um, to this the 64 C slice CT scanner in the emergency department. Um, can you indicate sir, whether that piece of equipment is functional at this point in time? And before, before I give the floor to Dr. Amo, um, the same information for the, the MRI and the, the 64 slice CT in the radiology department, whether all of this equipment is currently functional. I'll give way to Dr. Amo at this point, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, the short answer is yes, the, the three pieces of equipment are functional, but I'll just refer to my chief operations officer to confirm, but yes, I understand them to be functional. Yes, all three, yeah, all three equipment are, are operational. Regarding the 64 slice in um, radiology, there's uh, actually moisture in the room, so we're actually putting in a um, humidifier in order to solve that problem. So that machine will be back out on, um, on Friday. Otherwise, we have can, no other issue. Can you indicate how long it has been down for? For roughly like about one month. Right, so that takes me to the, to the other question of outsourcing. And I, I just want to tie this to the response by the CEO of uh, NWRHA in terms of the outsourcing arrangements. And Madam CEO of NWRHA that mentioned that they were outsourcing arrangements. Can I ask through UPS, um, because this will, you know, go for all of the RHAs, whether similar outsourcing arrangements are in place for the RHAs, for all the other RHAs, that's the first question. And whether we are in a position to indicate the cost um, to date in this financial year for that kind of outsourcing. So to you, Madam Chair, I'm just asking whether the PS, and I don't know if you may want to uh, defer this question or refer to any other official in the committee. Thank you, uh, to you, Chair. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would have to get that information from the respective um, CEO's member in terms of the outsourcing you would have done and, and the cost that they would have expanded so far for this fiscal year because the RHS would outsource directly. They, they would they would um, refer patients for those services directly. Yeah, if I may continue, Madam Chair, um, again, P.S., can you indicate whether this outsourcing arrangement is separate and apart from the external patient program or is it 
part of that program? And if so, if that program is still functional? So let me answer your, your um, last question first. Yes, that program is still functional, but what we have is that the RHAs have, have been doing a lot more of the outsourcing themselves directly, uh, simply because it is, it is more efficient and you also have, um, the turnaround time would be a lot shorter in terms of persons getting that, that service. So the EPP is still functional, but we have the RH is doing a bit more of the outsourcing for a lot of these diagnostic services. So this would be a procurement process and just um, in the interest of getting value for money, can you indicate how this outsourcing is done? All right, so, so I would let the RHs um, answer themselves in terms of their outsourcing arrangements, if I may. Thank you. So then can we therefore start with the Northwest Regional as authority? So hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity again. Um, so with respect to MRIs, because that's the service that we outsource primarily, what we would have done, we would have um, met with the various MRI suppliers and negotiate a cost. Um, I don't have the exact cost right now with me. I could provide that at a later time, but that is what we would have done in terms of trying to get the most cost-effective um, mechanism to outsource that particular type of diagnostic service. But, but what do you use as a basis for negotiation? Because what we see in the, in the response is something called market rates. So, you know, maybe for every other CEO who's going to answer, if they could also tie in what, what is this market rate? How does it relate to your, your cost for outsourcing? Okay? So with respect and, to MRI? Yes. Uh, with respect to MRI, what we would have done, we would have requested quotations from the, the service providers that do provide that particular service. And once we would have gathered the quotations, then we would have entered into negotiations with the various su suppliers based on their, their pricing and negotiate a standard cost in terms of um, that particular type of service. And what we also do in an effort to reduce these costs, we also have the option of doing the reporting ourselves. So basically we can get the images and do the reporting ourselves, which is um, Okay, so it seems we it seems we've lost the CEO for the Northwest Regional Health Authority. Might I therefore invite the CEO of the Eastern Regional Health Authority to um, join the conversation at this stage with respect to how you outsource and um, how do you come up with value for money based on the, the price you negotiate? Okay, um, Madam Chair, let me just say that. Um, the services, we do not really outsource diagnostic imaging services at this time, uh, except through our brother regional health authorities, brother and sister regional health authorities. So for example, if we need an MRI, we talk to North Central or anywhere else that has it available. We don't outsource from the private sector. But just let me say that as a matter of principle, um, because in other areas, for example, lab, we may need to outsource a test. We go through our normal procurement process where we would invite quotations from providers and we choose value for money based on both quality as well as price. But um, generally, we do not need to outsource uh, imaging services at this time. With, with that, um, with your situation, Mr. Sawyer, fact of not having generally to outsource, um, result from the amount of equipment you have, one or that, or and that your equipment really, um, which you have acquired, really specifically meets the needs of your catchment population. Okay, um, the. Outsourcing now is mainly for MRI, and that's because we do not have an MRI at this time in the RHA. Uh, with the new hospital that is uh, on the in in the middle of construction now, 
we will have MRI services then. We have also outsourced to the other regions some mammography services because we were in the process of upgrading our mammography machine. That upgrade has now been completed and therefore we will have the capacity in-house. What we are also doing is the mammography machine, uh, which we were replacing because of age, um, although um, we are replacing it, and although it is really out of service now with the manufacturers, we have preserved that machine and relocated it into primary care so that we will be able to do some work with that to supplement the work needed in our primary care setting and thereby even relieve more of the load on the hospital setting. But we do have a brand new um, mammography machine that is being in, that is now installed and um, that, that's it basically. MRI is outsourced still until we get the new MRI, the new hospital. Um, Chair, if I, if I may just before um, CEO, sorry if I um, finish his comments, can you indicate sir, maybe the number of MRIs that are outsourced on maybe a weekly or monthly basis? I know you, you have your technical team with you there. And the reason I'm asking that is because when the CEO of NW of NCRH speaks, um, I would want to get also an idea of the impact of your requests from the ERH on the NCRH's um, uh, capacity yeah. and capability. Yeah. But, but uh, Dr. Bodo, um, while I, I uh, understand the excitement to follow up the question, it, I would really um, ask if maybe you could hold it for a while because um, let's hear from the other CEOs sure. on the original question as it was posed. And I then will ask you to hold your guns a bit because um, Member McClashey also has had his hands up for quite some time. But, sure. but I'm sure you will get an opportunity to tie that back in. So my I you, ask the, member, the CEO for the Southwest Regional Health Authority to respond with respect to the question of outsourcing um, and, and costing. Sure. Um, thanks again for inviting me to, to respond. So similar to like Eastern RHA, um, we would need to outsource only in the instance where um, our equipment is down and we do enjoy some reserve capacity. Um, we, have not found, we have not found ourselves outsourcing within let's say, the last six to eight months. We have made improvements, both in terms of internal and use of the equipment operator use, as well as in particular with the CT scan. Um, we have gotten an additional uh, relatively new CT scan, even though the cool reports that it is just down due to ambient environment issues. And uh, well, before Point Fort was converted to a COVID facility commission, and there is a third CT scan. So we actually have three CT scans in Southwest. So unless all three are down, then we out, out we might find ourselves outsourcing. But that hasn't been the case. We we had two CT scans before at one facility um, up to a year ago. So. In prior years, outsource if required, um, like Eastern, um, once the need exists, has to be determined by the director of health based on the clinical urgency of the case. And therefore, from that true procurement, we would have the list of market rates and quotes. And therefore, um, based on the need of the patient, the type of, of, of requests and the market rate through procurement, well, then the selection will be made. And for us, we also pay attention to reconciliation so not only, is the, not only is the service outsourced, but we have to get our internal evidence for financial payment and accountability that the service was done. It's principally in the historical past has been for CTs, um, but as I said, that is much less now. Um, MRI, we have an MRI, but it's still a systemic risk as uh, based on the fact that um, we would likely get referrals from other arches as well. So MRI is a risk that if it goes down, we may need to outsource urgent cases all the other radiologic imaging modalities, we do have a fair amount of redundancy and operability in the system um, to move forward, particularly now with the commissioning of the Point Fortin Hospital that has a fairly good diagnostic suite, notwithstanding it's being used for COVID at this time. Thank you very much. And I think the, we still have the CEO of the North Central Regional Health Authority. CEO. Madam Chairman, Similarly, um, with, with the Southwest Regional Health Authority, 
the North Central Regional Health Authority does not outsource. Um, we, we've had, we've built redundancies in the system to facilitate. So for example, at the emergency department, at, at our, we have available at Eric Williams, two CT scans functioning, and that redundancy facilitates um, us, um, facilities and patients if we have a, a, a situation. Um, but in addition, we utilize the equipment at the, our brother and sister RHEs if there is in fact, as an alternative contingency, if, we, if, if there's a, an emergent downtime that, that affects patients, our, particularly our urgent and emergency patients. Okay, thank you. And uh, is the CEO of the Northwest Regional Health back with us? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm Chair. back. I, I got bumped off periodically. Yes, I know because um, we lost you during your presentation. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to complete your answer. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity again. So like I was saying before, with respect to the MRI services, we would outsource our emergency MRI services. And as I indicated, we would have negotiated pricing based on quotations received from the service providers. Our non-emergency MRI cases are outsourced to our other RHA brothers, and they, are, they do facilitate as well. So it's just the emergency MRI services we outsource. So it can, we can have a quicker turnaround time with, with respect to those requests. Thank you very much. Member McClatchy. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to step back a bit. We asked a question earlier about the efficiencies with regards to the imaging uh, suite. And I got from the various uh, RHAs that it was within standard and that it was based on resource allocation. But I want to go back to first principle. And I don't expect an answer, but I expect that we should get the information in writing at some time. And that is, we cannot measure the efficiency of the service, the service level and the deliverables, if we do not know how well these machines are bringing relief to persons. In other words, what is the turnaround time from that is normally associated with getting to these machines and being able to use them. Is it one week, two weeks, three days, one month? And I keep hearing about emergency services and my, my experience at the level of my constituency is people are complaining that they do not get um, access to these images. So whether we have service orders in place or we do good um, procurement activity, if the first principle of the service being delivered and what are our turnaround times and what are our backlogs, then we will begin to understand how efficient this service is. So I would just like to get from the various RHAs what has been the turnaround times and the backlogs associated with use of these machines. And I know, I don't expect uh, precise detail on every piece of equipment, but certainly we could make some extrapolations on what it is. I would like to understand that. Mr. Thomas, do you wish to respond? Madam Chair, in part, what we, what we can say though is that at the emergency, if we have emergency or urgent patients, they are seen immediately. They receive the diagnostic test immediately. Those are for urgent and emergency patients. Thank you. And uh, would I, uh, would any other regional health authority operate on a different basis? 
to what was stated there by the CEO of the North Central Regional Health. So basically, when it comes to urgent and emergencies, those are seen, those are dealt with immediately. And uh, those that are not, what kinds of turnaround time then? Is there an ability to give any sort of average? Yes, well, certainly for the Eastern RHA, um, I can ask uh, Dr. Sasha Maraj or Silla Bissessa to give you an idea, but certainly the emergencies like um, North Central are dealt with immediately. Um, Sasha, or, or would you like to just give what our waiting times? I know for basic extra, it's immediate. We have no waiting time for that. But for CT and uh, ultrasound and so on. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, certainly, as Seo has mentioned, our CT scans for the emergency patients, um, the scans are performed and the reports will be generated um, verbally or, in writ or written um, on the day within the 24 hours. Um, for our ultrasound services, similarly for our obstetric patients, the emergencies are dealt with right away. The elective cases may be up to about a week or so. Um, mammography and MRI, as we mentioned, those are outsourced for the time being. The um, If an emergency were to arise with one of those, we do try to facilitate that by an RHA to RHA arrangement. Uh, with the, uh, the CEO of the Southwestern Regional also assist us with their sort of waiting times. Okay, thank you. Um, overall, as like the other RHAs, inpatient services are, are, are immediate and even on the ward, generally get it while during the stay on the ward. Um, the outpatients, um, most of the services are weeks, with the exception of the MRI, where we do have a waiting list and echocardiograms. But I would allow quickly, with your permission, Chairman, just for Dr. Amiral from my team, he's the head of department radiology, to give a, a sense as he is the custodian of the services for so, so SWRHA to give any exactly. further relevant detail. Thank you very much. All right. So for general radiography, uh, that is a same day service. There's no wait time. Ultrasound, we currently have a walk-in service with no appointments. With, they will be accommodated on the same day. Outpatients, we currently have a two-week um, wait time for cases that are deemed non-urgent. CT scans, as with the other RHAs, all emergency patients are turned over within 24 hours from performance to reporting. Routine cases currently stand at four to six weeks appointment time. Um, our MRI, as the CEO alluded to, because of our, our major uh, breakdowns that we suffered in the um, immediate past, we are currently uh, more patients same day to 72 hours and routine outpatients stand at December 2022. Mammography, we currently uh, accommodate walk-in patients. Uh, the routine symptomatic patients are given uh, one to two week uh, outpatient appointments. Uh, CM, uh, fluoroscopy theater, there is no waiting time. Okay, thank you very much. And um, with respect to, I don't think we have heard from the, the Northwest Regional with respect to waiting times. Hi, Madam Chair again. Um, so with respect to urgent emergency cases, similar with the other RHAs, are done immediately, same day, especially when they're on the ward. With respect to routine, CTs and x-rays, uh, it would be a two-week waiting period, and the reporting period is within 24 to 48 hours. Member Bethelme? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to all health care professionals. Madam President, um, sorry, Madam Chair, I just want to go back to um, CEO Bash um, when we were talking about outsourcing for the uh, on the side of the patient. If um, you do need to outsource, can you just walk me through the steps um, 
that the patient will have to go through. Um, and not only that, but if you are doing your own reporting, is it a shorter waiting time for the patient versus if the, 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 um, the supplier is doing the reporting on behalf of the RHA? Uh, so with respect to the, the process flow, uh, with respect to emergency MRIs, of course, um, the doctors will do the referral. The referral is then submitted to the director of health's office. And then we do the letters to the, the external service provider, um, given the approval for the referrals to be done. And the patient is transported to have the MRI service done once we book the appointment, et cetera, with the service provider. With respect to the reporting part of it, um, when we do the reporting, that gives us the opportunity to negotiate a lesser cost because part of an external service provider cost is not only the images, but the actual reporting of it. So we have the ability to negotiate the cost um, to, you know, to be more effective once we do the reporting. So as far as waiting times are concerned, let's just say for someone who may not be considered an emergency, because I am familiar with situations where persons have been waiting months to receive their, um, their reports and will have to go back to their doctors and schedule another appointment to come back. So that's what, so I'm just trying to get an, an, an idea and an understanding for the actual waiting time and the, the, the time of the process, really. Is it right. so one to two days? Are you expected to, to receive the, the report um, within a month? So the non-emergency cases would be outsourced to fellow RHAs, et cetera. Um, right. In terms of the average wait time, uh, it's usually, um, uh, I don't have the average wait time right now, but in terms of the reporting, it, it's pretty um, accessible. Uh, but that would be dependent on the availability and the booking of the service at the respective um, institution. Okay. And my second question is for Mr. Davlin Thomas. Um, I'm familiar with uh, situations where persons will be transferred from the Arima Hospital to the Eric Williams um, Medical Complex to have an MRI done. And um, they are told that a radiologist is not on staff or that person didn't come today or they are short staff. Is it that you um, are not sufficiently staffed in, in those departments? And if you are not, do you have consultants that you that you uh, hire or contract to have these 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 um, imaging services conducted? Through you, Madam Chair, the I just want to emphasize the process though, that the radiologist rarely comes into play at the tail end of the service to engage the reporting so that the availability of a radiologist would not deter whether a service is going to be performed, particularly a diagnostic service. However, um, a point to note is that we also have remote reporting at the NCRHA so that whilst a, radio a radiologist can at the facility provide diagnostic reports for our diagnostic imaging services. They can do that at home. They can do that in Mayaro. They can do that wherever they are in the country. Um, we have at least 20 of our practitioners who provide that remote service for the RHA currently. The transfers from the Arima General Hospital would, would basically be via ambulance usually. Um, I, so I'm, I'm not sure um, wh what was the context. If it's an emergency, oh. they, they go directly into the... Oh, 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 into the okay, so let me department. just be a little more clear, right? It's not the reporting. It's to have the actual service conducted. It's not the reporting aspect of it. But to actually have the MRI done, that's... Yeah, so that's what I'm really talking about. Not the reporting. To actually have the MRI done. Um, persons are being told that there's no one available to actually conduct the MRI, not the reporting. We have not even gotten to the reporting aspect of it. Just to have the MRI done is what I'm really speaking about. Well, we, we actually log this information. 
we, um, Ms. Mongru could elaborate, but we do not have, we basically have zero waiting times for our emergency transfers for MRIs, even from outside of the, the, the RHA, except if, you, if there's a situation where the MRI is in use, and that might be likely. Um, if, if a patient is transferred, the, the MRI may be in use at that time. But um, beyond that, we, we have 24-hour coverage um, with multiple practitioners. Radiologists. As in consultants? Radiographers. Radiographers. Those are the persons. So the consultants, the radiographers mm -hmm. do the scans, and the radiologists, they are the doctors who report. Right. So the, all right. So the consultants are the ones conducting the scans. No. No. No, they aren't. Right. The so who conducting the scans? Radiographers. Right. Radiographers are and the ones any, conducting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and at in any given time, we would have a number of radiographers on, on site. The issue, though, is that we, the equipment may be utilized at a specific time. Um, we don't know, we, we may have to determine how that kind of feedback um, arrives at the patient or the relative. But, uh -huh. but it, it, the only thing that may stop someone from having a scan immediately would be if the equipment is in use Patrick, and, and, and because we only have one MRI at Eric Williams um, if it's a CT scan which is a little more we've increased the number of CT scan machines that we have available based on the, the, the throughput, the flows um, mm -hmm. so we have two available but basically we have 24 hour coverage with multiple radiographers on staff um, that those, those are the facts so just for my understanding, just give me a little more information as far as your consultants are concerned and what are their actual jobs at the Eric Williams or at the ERG. Chair, through you, could I ask that the DOH give that insight, provide that insight, the Director of Health, Dr. Ojuru? And, and this is, the question is as far as the diagnostic Imaging services, right? Yes. Yes. But Dr. Ojuro seems to have been bumped off. But but the the radiologists basically are those specialists that are trained to interpret imaging mm -hmm. um, after the imaging is taken. Um, in some instances, yeah. So in in, in some instances. Dependent on the severity, the me or the acuity or the nature of the request, which tends to be elective, they may be they may be required to be present, but that is not often. But they give their overall impression of the image that is taken and report on it. What we've done to ensure that, because for example, we we must confess that in the past we did have a backlog of reports. Um, a lot, possibly 6,000 or so, um, over the last year, um, within, uh, again, the, we have a operation quality and operation quality committee of the board and the board itself that monitors these things. Um, we've brought that, we've wrestled that backlog to just about 100, and that has the, the close attention of the board and the executive. So basically, and some of the innovations that has facilitated that is the remote reporting so that those radiologists or consultants as you put it they can give their impression of an image either at the hospital mm -hmm. or they can provide that intervention or impression analysis synthesis interpretation mm -hmm. of the image in a remote space so I just have one more question. What are their contracted working hours? The DOH is going to give you that information now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With specificity, yeah. Chair, Chair through you, um, the consultants are uh, 28 hours a week on site and on call after that. 
<laughs> while the other cadre of staff are 40 hours on site a week and on call after. Thank you so much, Dr. Boru. Okay, we'll come back to Dr. Boru. Thank are you, you there? Ma'am. Yes, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know why my camera is, seems to be off. I'm on. So, why are we not seeing you? We can't hear you. All right, great. Okay. So, I just wanted to go back to the issue of um, of the waiting times, Madam Chair. Um, I, I heard the head of radiology for San Fernando would have mentioned the waiting time for routine requests of December 2022 for MRI. Um, and I know certainly he could not be happy with that because, you know, there are some that would say that if you had to wait one year for an MRI, then perhaps you don't need it. Um, but my, my question really is directed to um, the PS in terms of whether there are any internal benchmarks, are there any benchmarks for what is perceived to be an acceptable waiting time? Um, benchmarks by the Ministry of Health that would be ruled out and discussed and agreed to by the RHAs. So, yes, Ali, I don't know whether you might want to, if you can come in on this, because I know at one time there was this issue of the patient chart and what the patient can expect and so on with regards to waiting time. So, I don't know if you can have some input in that regard. Um, thank you, Chair. Chair, through you, I, I let my CMO uh, maybe speak to that matter about the quality standards that we would expect from the RHAs. Hi, thank you, Dr. Bodo. Um, so generally speaking, there are standards of, of service that is expected um, for each different, for different types of radiology services, for example, CT scans. Um, what, is, what is being utilized would be not so much so as a benchmark, but more as to what pertains in other jurisdictions. For example, in other parts of the world, um, they would have varying waiting times for different types or modalities of testing. But what, what we see um, really as a quality standard is patients getting their diagnostic services so that their disease doesn't progress at all um, and their clinical outcome is as good as can be. We can, what I can do, uh, commit to doing is getting our worldwide benchmarks that for each of the diagnostic imaging services that have been listed by the RHAs in writing back to the committee so that you can get an idea of what pertains in other jurisdictions as well as what we use in, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, just by analogy. But really and truly, I, I do want to benchmark and say someone should be waiting for an ultrasound for three months. It depends on the clinical scenario, depends on if it's an emergency, emergent, or if it is something that is um, very routine and benign. So it all depends on the clinical scenario and will vary according to the type of condition. So I can give that in writing back to the committee. Yeah, thank you. Yes, CMO. Um, Madam Chair, if, if I may just um, ask a question on the issue of maintenance, if that's okay. Sure, you may. Yeah. So if I may refer um, to um, all of the RHAs, in fact, to Table 4, which looks at the cost of maintenance per machine per RHA. And of course, we all agree that maintenance of equipment is a very, very important part of providing um, value for money and an efficient and effective service. Um, but I, I just, you know, in perusing this table, for example, if we look at the cost of maintenance per machine per RHA, and if we look at the, the column entitled CT, CT system or CT scan, I presume it, that's what's meant. We're seeing a big difference here in terms of the RHAs, ERHA 425,000, NCRH is 641,736. NWRHA, 1 million, 1.5 million. SWRHA, 950,000. So I don't know if I can treat you, Madam Chair, maybe ask the CEOs of the different RHAs to uh, perhaps explain, you know, um, and then we can come to com some conclusion as to why there's such a vast difference. I, I think this needs a little bit of um, clarification. So maybe we can start with ERHA. 
Okay, uh, we're talking about city. Uh, we have a service contract, but let me ask um, uh, our paraclinical services manager maybe uh, to indicate the value and so on of that service contract. Sela? Hi, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our maintenance contract involves preventative maintenance on a quarterly basis. Um, basically, I'm not too sure if this would account for the different arches, but I know probably because ours is a 16 slice unit, um, the cost may vary from one of the larger units. However, what we have had is an arrangement with the company that will normally come in on a quarterly basis. If we have any downtime, for example, let us say the machine goes down today, we have a 98 percent uptime guarantee where we call in the company, they come, they do their checks, they repair whatever the issues are um, that have been working for us so far. Basically, it involves different checks on the system as well as um, phantom checks as we go along, but more or less that's what our service involves. Could I just add? Um in support that we have our service contracts uh, hold the service suppliers to a 95 to 98% uptime uh, during the course of the contract. Uh, also, if they, um, if they come in, they have four hours response time. In other words, when we make a, response, a, a, a request, they have four hours in which to have a technician on site. And if they are not able within 48 hours to diagnose, uh, they have to have manufacturer support uh, to be provided. So these are the terms. Um, and the service contract cost is what uh, you would see reflected in that table for one CT scan. Thank you very much. And maybe we can invite the CEO of the Northwest Regional Health Authority, which appears to be the highest figure, um, to give her insight on what is done with respect to their maintenance and to explain this high disparity yes, for their good afternoon. Scan. Yes. good afternoon again, Madam Chair. So there, we do have a vast difference with our service contract because our situation is a little different. Our CT machine, which is the main CT machine presently at Port of Spain General Hospital, is encased in a container because since our fire in 2019, which destroyed our radiology department where our main CT machine was located and that was damaged, etc. Our containerized CT is now the main CT at Port of Spain until we are back up and running with our radiology department. So this service contract cost includes... Uh, the cost for maintaining the environment, the ramp, all electronics in this containerized system, the CT unit, as well as all electronics associated with this container CT machine. So it's not just a CT machine, but all the electronics associated in the environment that the CT is presently housed in. Our service contract also provides us with monthly checks, quarterly PMs, preventative maintenance checks, and emergency callouts from Sunday to Sunday, and it includes parts, et cetera. So that would, be, would, that would account for the difference because it's just not the CT machine, but the actual containerized unit that it is in, that, that is that um, service cost for. Uh, Marcio, is there a way for you to disaggregate that cost so that you know what is specific to the machine versus what um, needs? So as you see that containerized environment uh, the um the company did not disaggregate their overall men, um service contract course between the machine as opposed to the unit etc it was a, a holistic course that was provided in their service contract thank you very much um dr Budu, are you finished or do you want to hear um the other 20 um RHEs? Yeah, no, I, I think because I'm seeing the cost at Southwest RHA is also um, close to a million dollars. And I just wanted to be clear that this is per machine because I um, I know that Southwest now has three machines. So is that cost reflective of three machines or is it per machine? 
because the heading of the table says the cost of maintenance per machine. So I don't know if the Southwest CEO can just provide some clarification for the benefit of the committee and the public. Sure, I know the cost to be um, per machine. I would just show you, Chairman, ask my Chief Operations Officer to expand a bit in terms of the cost. Um, yes, you have. we have preventive maintenance contracts and preventive maintenance schedule. Um, with the demand on the services, um, for example, um, there are other wearable parts that would, that even though, let us say, the machine is installed at a particular year because um, of the population we serve and the high demand for tests, you'll find the wearability of parts. So I do know at, um, that we have replaced tubes and so forth, but I just allow the coup with his expertise to just enlighten the committee in terms of the cost and the maintenance factors like the other RHS contributed. Hi, good afternoon. We are also like the other RHS. We have a preventative maintenance um, contract quarterly, yearly. Uh, we have emergency call, call out. Uh, we serve a large population, about 640,000 people. So we do like a lot of scans, so it's have a lot of wear tear on the tubes. So one tube actually, uh, the uses of a tube is actually a half a million um, scanning seconds. So most of the time, our tubes like, go like very quickly because they're among the patients that we scan. I, I just want to close with one more question um, for you, Chair. Um, and perhaps the CEOs may want to look at this. Is there, is there a time when the equipment is deemed too expensive to maintain, so, so to speak, at which point you look at the, uh, procuring new equipment? Is, is there like a benchmark or, or does it depend on the individual piece of equipment? And uh, Dr. Wudu, which CEO are you posing this to? Dr. Yes. Sorry, I should perhaps pose this to the PS um, whether the ministry may have some um, some guidance or guidelines in terms of that. Because the point I'm making is that if your you know expenditure becomes so excessive that it might make sense to part with that particular machine and procure a new machine. So I think there are guidelines that can be shared with us. Sure. Thank you. I treat you, Chair. So. Yes. Just before. Just, just a moment. I think sure. in answering that question, if you could really um, just not look at the cost, but what determines the, the factors determining life cycle length of, of, of a piece of machine, because it might not just only be the cost factor. So if you could deal with it in a, a more comprehensive way. Thanks. Sure, not a problem. So I would ask Mr. Taylor to, to, to speak to that issue. Uh, as you said, Paul is our biomedical consultant who's looking at at, at, at these issues across the sector. So I believe I'll just let Paul speak a bit about what are the factors you look at in determining replacement of, of, of these sort of assets. Mr. Taylor? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Well, the, each piece of equipment, when it's first purchased, has an expected life, all right? And typically for medical imaging systems, it's seven to 10 years, depending on, on the manufacturer and the type of system. So in the first instance, the RHAs would purchase with that expectation that there is a seven, 10 year cycle, right? Um, as, as a matter of policy currently in the ministry, um, RHAs are encouraged to engage the supplier to provide an extended warranty. So that means that the cost of maintenance for the first five years of the unit has been capitalized in the purchase. So that first five-year period, nothing comes out of recurrent expenditure to sustain the system. It really is between year six and when the RHA decides to um, replace that particular unit. And they would be looking at um, that gradual cost, one, they look at the annual cost in that this window of uh, six to 10 years. They'd also look at breakdowns, the uptime. I think once you mentioned putting into um, your service contract agreement uptime requirements, 95%, 98%. If the, the system is such that the supplier is unable to sustain that as you go through, then that's one indicator that the technology itself has reached the end of its usefulness in your system. 
and replacement. Um, so that's that's basically the, the rule of thumb that is now um, used. What the ministry, um, what my work with the ministry, what we hope to do is implement an objective method. In fact, we're, we're now having that discussion, um, system called um, MERS, which is M-E-R-S, which is Medical Equipment Replacement Score, a score system that they can um, objectively rate certain aspects of it, the three components that come up with a score, and that basically gives a really good indicator, all right? And this is an international standard practice, a really good indicator of when you need to replace the equipment. Um, as I said, that's that's part of, of my responsibility in implementing these, these types of um, systems. But currently, it is... It's covered by extended warranty in that first five years. So the maintenance is capitalized. And then RHAs will then look at their ongoing costs between year six to say year 10 as an indicator of how that cost changes over that time to determine, okay, it's it's really time to replace. That's typically what happens now. Thank you. That, uh, I think that gives us the answer we're looking for there. Um, if I may just engage just, uh, just one more. And I know the RHS will be looking in terms of saving costs again, value for money, are doing a lot of internal um, maintenance. And in that regard, using biomedical technicians. Um, can you give us an update perhaps on whether there's a program that is covered and controlled by the Ministry of Health uh, in terms of the biomedical technicians in, in the RHS? Can you provide some through the, through the PS, um, through you, Madam Chair, and through PS? Um, let me make sure I understand your question. That when you say a program, what do you referring to? Developmental program for for biomedical technicians. All right. Actually, that is actually now um, happening with the assistance of PAHO. All right. Um, the Pan American Health Organization has actually come in, and currently there are two streams of developmental training taking place. Stream number one is a Caribbean wide webinar funded and hosted by PAHO. Um, and it's it started in the middle of this year and it will go on probably for the next six months where they are focusing on key developmental issues uh, in the field of um, healthcare technology management. But that's for the entire Caribbean. The second stream of training, which PAHO has, um, again, is, is leading, where the training specific to Trinidad. So basically the first session was a session where they had a, a, a poll, a survey, of the biomedical community and identify the key uh, areas of concern about the community of practice. And then a training program was developed to target those specific concerns. So that is also ongoing and will probably be flowing for the next year or so, but it's PAHO driven. And um, there's a third tier of training, third stream of training that looks at specific local issues in terms of technical capacity um, that's really just in the initial stages of identifying those things. But currently, the ministry um, is partnering with PAHO to um, execute this developmental training of biomedical engineers and, and technicians in the country. So there's a capacity building that's on, being undertaken currently. Yeah, thank you. And just, just one last question, Madam Chair. Again, with regards to the, the um, numbers of biomedical technicians and engineers, in the health system, the public health sector, um, where, where are we? Are we are we okay? Are we short? Um, can you give us a ballpark figure? Or perhaps PS can give us a ballpark figure. Sure, uh, thank you. I uh, through you, Chair. I'm I'm not sure whether we have completed that particular assessment, and, and that member would also depend on on the type of equipment, the age of the equipment, the the um, the level of maintenance required. So I know the respective RHA would continue to look at their, at their particular circumstance, what are their equipment, their asset base, and what is the support they require in-house. Um, so maybe if the Irish will want to maybe just chime in in terms of their current capacity and if there are any gaps. And, and challenges. Gaps. Yeah. No? Well, Chair, for you, I, I just wanted to state for the record that there are two agencies that currently provide um, uh, training and development for for biomedical technicians. One is UTT and one is the University of the West Indies. So there's a surplus though 
outside and of, of availability of that category of technician. So they are available to the system. And currently, the, the information that I, that, that in terms of the ratios of equipment, um, we're, they're categorized as well to do in terms of those that are under warranty, those that require spe specialist intervention by the companies and so on, uh, and, and those that we actually engage in-house. Um, and some of the training for our technicians as well, though, is acquired through the, the supplier as a part of the procurement arrangement. So when we tender, there's, it's, it's installation, commissioning, and training. So in addition, and, some, and to some, for some pieces of equipment, that training requires certification from a parent company as well too. So we have those tiers. One, that, that we, we actually have the biomedical technician who provides that, that support directly to like infusion pumps and so on. Um, but for the larger pieces of equipment, we have the extended warranties and the maintenance arrangements that take place for, for them. And for some pieces of equipment, there's a kind of hybrid relationship where or arrangement where some aspects of the maintenance is covered via the, via the supplier or the, and, and some routine maintenance is done in-house. And those are very specific. Okay, so thank you. can we go on? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And maybe to get a better uh, view of the specific question that was asked, each RHA could give us that answer in writing. Because basically, you want to know that you have the technical support for the equipment that you have, regardless of what kind of arrangement. So you want to see what the arrangements are as full um, piece of equipment. Okay, so that um, for each RG, we could get that tonight. Okay, um, I'll go on to Member Bethalamy. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. So before I ask my next question, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our healthcare professionals. I know you have been working tirelessly for the past two years. Um, when with that being said, um, I know that you are fully aware that your performance is judged by our citizens ex who, who, who are visiting the various RHAs, um, their waiting time and all of that, right? So my question really is, um, as far as the MRI is concerned, what is the waiting time or how long does it, do, or how long does it take to complete an MRI? Um, and this can go to any one of the CEOs or Mr. Permanent Secretary or even a member of the technical staff. So what you're asking is from having the image to the report? Is that no, the actual doing? MRI is like the actual MRI. How long um, does it take for the MRI to be completed? And the reason why I'm asking that question um, is to really get an idea. So my... So the follow-up question will really be, if it takes, let's just say, 30 minutes to complete an MRI, how many, how many persons do you think you'll be able to see um, on average in one day? So, um, might, might I start with the CEO for the um, NWRHP, if you'd like to give an idea of that. I mean, I guess it might be simple if you look in terms of there is a response. There is a response to question 11. I think it's 11 um, Roman numeral 4, which gives us a sort of average per year with respect to each of the um, RHEs. So I don't know if that allows a springboard for the discussion based on the question asked by the member. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. With respect to the, the actual time it takes for an MRI scan, I would ask um, our head of radiology, Dr. Boudra, to comment on this as, you know, this is his, it's a technical question and he would be able to provide that particular answer. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm very sorry, but... Um, 
See, not no, because it doesn't have an MRI machine. Maybe I could ask one of the RHA that actually has an MRI machine to maybe answer that question, if, if, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Yes. Sure, Sri Chairman, I could offer because we have an MRI at South Plus, and I would immediately refer to your permission, Chairman, to Dr. Amaral, as it is a technical question. He's the head of the department. So, Dr. Amaral? Sure. Uh, each examination is peculiar in the sense that you have some examinations that would be quite time consuming. For example, if you were to be doing an entire spine series, which would be neck, thoracic, and lumbar spine you're looking at in excess of an hour. The shortest scan time that you are looking at would probably be 30 minutes, which would be a plain brain scan. So you're looking at on the, on the lower side, 30 minutes to probably one and a half hours if you're going to be doing contrast runs and non-contrast runs. Just remember, Ms. Alamine. Um, so just one more question, Madam President. Sorry, yes. Madam Chair. Um, to Mr. Soifat and Mrs. Bash. So is there a, pro a projected date for the Eastern um, Regional Health Authority and the West Regional Health Authority, the Northwest Regional Health Authority, to obtain MRI machines? And if yes, when? The the carded date for opening of the new Sangre Grande uh, hospital, all right, will be February 2023. And that's when MRI services will become available okay. uh, within the, the Eastern RHA. And Mrs. Bash? So with respect to the Port of Spain Hospital in particular, the new central block is scheduled to have an MRI machine. However, in the near future, meaning um, maybe by mid next year, we should have our MRI machine at the St. James Medical Complex. And once that is um, accomplished, we would be able to therefore do our own MRI um, scans at the St. James Medical Complex. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So thank you. I just wanted to get a little assistance from the CEO of the Northwest Regional Health with respect to Appendix 1. And um, this is with respect to the description of the machine, the location, the status, the maintenance schedule, downtime, and so on. And to get some clarification with respect to what downtime meant. If this was, for instance, you have the containerized 16 slice CT scan, 70 hours. Is this a program 70 hours that the machine is done? Um, over what period? Or are you talking about breakdowns that are not scheduled? I'm, I'm not sure that I understand uh, a machine being done for 70 hours, another one 20 hours, another one five hours. What is this? You could really expand on this first, please. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. So with respect to the CT machine, this downtime was calculated in the in one calendar year. So um, our CT machine is up 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days. So the 70 hours accounts for time given for repairs and for service, because remember, we do have to schedule our services because we have our monthly service and quarterly PMs. So when we take a look at the actual downtime in comparison to the uptime, this accounts for 0.799% downtime because we are looking at a 24 hour period over 365 days. Okay, so each, one minute, Madam CEO. So, and this might cut to the chase so that with respect to your downtimes, this is per year, all those, so this particular downtime was calculated for the last year, from November last year to November this year, to give you yes. a sample of the type of downtime, an average um, idea of the downtime. But for every category, your downtime, what I'm trying to find out, that downtime um, column refers to per year. So that, for instance, yes. your your general X-ray unit, Karen Archel Center, its downtime was five hours for a year. 
Yes. Last year to now. Last year, yes. November to now. Yes. And and that would have taken into account three quarterly um, preventative maintenance checks and one annual preventative maintenance check. Yes, the downtime is calculated based on repairs and service for the year. All right. So what, what I would like to find out is this. Um, in terms of the these maintenance schedules, it means that the three PMs, as say, for instance, per year would be at fixed times. Would yes, that be correct? The would yes, the company will schedule with us. All right. And for these schedule maintenance times are they have they been kept in the last year for your machines pardon or can you repeat madam chair okay so for instance let's look at one the containerized 16 slide ct scan you say 3 p.m per year and you're saying that these are predetermined times have those three p.m's been done at the scheduled times. So be, be, because of COVID, we would have had um, fluctuations in terms of the scheduling of the various services. So you would have had um, rescheduling, but have they been done? Yes. So whatever the maintenance, so if it is that you were supposed to have one annual check for a PC equipment, has it been done? Yes. yes. Okay. And based on the rescheduling, has there been any detrimental impact on the performance of the, any of the equipment as a result of not having been able to meet scheduled times? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, I also wanted to find out with respect to the general X ray unit which is at room one, accident and emergency, um, which you have here 13 hours for repairs and maintenance to become functional. It is currently not functional or not functioning. Am I correct? It is currently functional. It is currently functional. Yes, because so it, it, has, it has since been repaired then? Yes. And could you say for how long was it done before the repairs were completed? Um, I could provide that information to you at a later time. I can't tell you offhand right now. Okay, that'll be fine. And in respect of, there are several other extra units which have to be um, waiting on parts. Could you say if they are up and running, I think it's yours, where they say that by the November, yes. So for instance, your ultrasound machine at the maternity ultrasound department, which was supposed to be started and, and running by November. Is that up? Yes, those are functional, uh, Madam Chair, in terms of the status. The status. And so, okay, what, I, what you can do for me, um, see you, um, in the interest of time, there are a number of ones that are, at the time that this table was done, they weren't functioning and parts were to be delivered and installed by November, 2021. If you could let us know what the current status would be of those um, pieces of equipment. So like a mobile X-ray unit, Okay, yeah. where there was an instance of that. Yes, we All right? provide us and, and in the instance that, say, a mobile extra unit was done because you didn't have parts, would that have impacted the services available to the public? And how would you have addressed that? So the, uh, the short answer is no, because we have multiple mobile X-ray units, so we do have redundancy in the system. So there would not have been any adverse impact. Okay. Um, thank you very much. All right, so Dr. Bodo, is there anything else you would like to ask? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to draw the attention of this 
respective CEOs to table one in terms of the sums allocated for the purchasing of diagnostic imaging services in the 2020-21 allocation. Um, and if, if through you, Madam Chair, if I can ask, so, because it's the ERHA, the NWRHA, and the SWRHA would have benefited from these sums. Now I'm seeing 2020-21, which I'm presuming would have been the last financial year. Um, so just say, if we can get an update um, from each of the RHAs, three Madam Chair, perhaps through the CEOs, as to whether how much how much of that would, would have been achieved um, based on this table. Right. So the, the three that we have here would be the Eastern Regional Health, the Northwest Regional Health, and the Southwest Regional Health. So if we could ask each of the CEOs to comment in that order, please. Our PSIP is 100%, but let me just ask um, uh, who is there? Uh, Silla, can you tell us? I think it's just the mammography equipment we had this year, the last year. Sure. Yeah. So, our mammography unit has been installed. They're currently in the process of doing testing and commissioning. In terms of our two ultrasound machines, funding approval was received. We should actually be receiving those within the next three to four months, similarly with the echo machine. As it relates to our four CTG machines, we have been following up with the company. They have given us the assurance by the end of January next year, we should receive those machines. If I may, just before we leave the ERHA, um, so this procurement was would have been in the last financial year. Yes, it was within the last fiscal year. Right. And you're saying that, for example, for the CTG machines, you, you've been promised January of 2022. Yes. So I just want to raise a broader question, and perhaps when the other CEOs respond, if that's a similar issue, in terms of supply chain and procurement with regards to COVID, whether you've been experiencing um, issues, because, for example, the, the CTG machines are not really um very fancy well not ex you know it's equipment that should be easily available so can you can you comment on that let's see you i don't know if you might want to take this up um, um madam chair if i if i may maybe i can um, just make a general statement with regard to the issue of um the supply chain challenges in response to member Bodo's uh, question remember yes a short answer yes we have experienced significant challenges with regard to COVID and, and, and supply chain. Um, I hear you that the equipment might have been fairly routine, but it, it, it doesn't matter. It is, I mean, some have been worse than others, but the COVID has really had an effect on, on the supply of, of equipment. So a lot of things that we might have hoped to have gotten in the last fiscal year, you might find them rolling over, right? Simply because of, of the, um, the delays that none of us could have predicted that, and I mean, the Irishes will tell you as you speak to them, they've been working with the suppliers, but with, with varying degrees of success. But that has been a challenge. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted perspective on that. Madam Chair, I think we just have in WRHA and this WRHA. I don't they may want to respond just to complete the answers. Sure. Hi, good afternoon again, Dr. Bodo. Uh, with respect to the items listed for NWRH, this is, um, I believe this was a, a typo error because um, actually the, equip the two diagnostic equipment we procured last fiscal year is a portable ultrasound machine for Port of Spain Hospital. Uh, that has been delivered and the company is, is supposed to schedule the user training so we can commission that equipment. And the other item that we would have procured last financial year would be a 128 slice CT machine, which will be going to Port of Spain Hospital in our refurbished radiology department, which I mentioned was previously destroyed with a fire in 2019. And um, the last update we got from the company um, indicated that that piece of machinery should um, land in country by the end of December. But of course, um, we may have a little delay because of the global supply chain. But that was the last update we got from the supplier with respect to the CT machine. Thank you, CEO. Um, it, my attention was drawn to it because of the fact that you were looking at an echo machine suite for the cardiac department. 
Um, can you say whether you actually have that piece of equipment then? No, no, this, this was oh, um, this was not procured, but we do have two echo machines in the Fort of Spain. Okay, yes. that's fine. That's the answer I'm looking for. Thank you. But, but might I ask then, CEO, if you will also give us the, the in terms of your saying, the items, the machines identified here are not really what were procured. Um, you said it was mistaken. Was it that you had changed from what you wanted or you can't account for these two pieces of equipment that are identified here? And then what would have been the allocation for the portable ultrasound machine and also for the 128 slice CT machine? Um, with respect to what is submitted in here, that, um, that was not part of our procurement for last year as it relates to the budgetary allocation for the items that I did identify. I can provide that to you um, at a later date. I don't have that information at hand. All right. Thank you very much. And, and I think now we call on Southwest Regional Health Authority. Yes. Okay, yes, so Chairman. Like, like, um, so, sorry, like, like Northwest. Um, the equipment listed here and the sums is what we would have submitted in 2020, 2021 for allocation to procure this year, which we are on track to do. So our last two years, we have spent 100% PSIP. So I would just allow Kuta to indicate what we actually did um, procure successfully within the last PSIP allocation. But I believe like Northwest, this is for the upcoming one, which we went through the submission of the um, of the request in 2020, 2021. So I'll allow Kuta to explain what we actually achieve. And well, this is on track to be achieved this year. Sure. Okay, so we did we did achieve one a uh, one CM for the operating theater, and all the other um, equipment will be will be probably acquired within um 2021-2022 um, allocation. So, uh, in terms of so, did you exhaust your 2020-2021 allocation? No, most of those, some of those funds were utilized um, uh, for COVID, um, COVID spending. So it, it, actually, we would get back our funding back from the ministry. That is, uh, yeah, so, so what I'd like to, what I'd like to add is that the, those what is listed here is what is upcoming. So therefore, we will be able to supply, um, in terms of the question asked, what was allocated for 2020, 2021, just completed and the equipment details of what we are actually able to procure um, successfully. So it's under medical equipment vote, and therefore we would have gotten the equipment. I don't have the information here right now, but we'll be able to supply that as a supplemental. So we use all the funding for the year just gone. Okay, so um, CEO, if I understand you well, the allocate, the real allocating of funds towards COVID would not have negatively impacted your acquisition of your planned um, equipment for 2020-2021 fiscal year? No, it, it would not have impacted on the 2020-2021. Some of the items they had took into mind, some of the needs for COVID. So we'll be able to give you a detailed list as to what is allocated in PSIP and what we were able to procure fully. Um, as I said, like Northwest, what I'm seeing listed here as presented to the committee is what we have put in and, and we intend to purchase this year. So we'll be able to give you the list of what we procured successfully last year. Okay, thank you. And you would also tell us the allocation? Yes. I okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I think, therefore, um, the, I would want to invite the CEO of the North Central Regional Health Authority because what we were told is that the funds for the purchasing of diagnostic imaging services will reprioritize the other types of medical equipment based on their needs. So that if, if the CEO for the North Central Regional Authority could give us an idea of what they intended, what equipment they intended, and sort of the justification for reprioritizing, because hopefully it would not have impacted on a need you had identified. Chairman, um, thankfully, the Ministry of Health was able to secure some pieces of equipment via a gift to the nation. Um, so the 
equipment that we intended to get, for example, the, an ultra uh, uh, mammo machine, mammography machine, which is a stereotactic machine, um, a 64 slice CT scanner was given at Eric Williams. And we also received the power injectors for that CT as part of the donation. But in addition to that, we would have had donated a digital X-ray unit at, and again at the Eric Williams. So um, basically, again, that we, we would have gotten the mammo, mammography machine donated that we, we needed, the 64 slice CT uh, power injector for the CT and the digital X-rays. And those were um, basically our intention. So essentially, once those once those those donations were secured, we were able to engage other kinds of procurement. All right. So could you just let us do then what were the digital the diagnostic imaging machines which you acquired by donation in 2020, 2021? And you could give us that in writing. Okay. We'll do, Madam Chair. We'll yes. All right. So can I now invite member Bodo to ask any other question which she may wish to ask? Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, just two, two items. I, I don't intend to keep the senior people in the health sector any longer. I know they have a lot more on their heads with the COVID-19. Um, but with regards to the, the appendix and the NCRH and the Cuba Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, um, Perhaps the CEO of NCRH can look at this. Um, I know this facility has been um, working for the for COVID-19 and so on, but I see general x-ray, two units, non-functional. CEO, that's item number five. I don't know if you can give us an update on that. And also if you can um, tell us whether every, well, I see everything else here seems to be functional. I see general x-ray, two units, non-functional. Can you comment on that, CEO? Give us an update on that. Basically, those units are located at departments, for example, at the emergency department at Cuba Hospital, which isn't in use at yes. any rate currently. Okay. Um, but, but they are awaiting replacement parts. Um, it is not a high priority need. We have other redundancies in the, in the um, system, system. But, but basically, um, because it is on warranty, the, the need is being satisfied via UDCOT and certainly the... Um, sure, the understood. In, in view of that, and I understand that to you, that wouldn't be a priority until you get back to normal. That's what you're saying. Um, but the, the mobile extra units, because with the COVID-19, of course, you need um, X-rays and so on being done frequently. Can you say if those two units are sufficient at this point in time to service the needs of those patients at Cuba? I'm talking currently. about the mobile, the mobile X-ray, the two units that you have there. Yeah, currently they are. They are. Yes. All right, Madam yeah. Chair, I, I have no further questions. I just want to close with one suggestion and to the PS, and um, is there something that we can think about now? What we've found with COVID nineteen is that hospitals have Although they have been saving lives, they've also become dangerous places. And I say this um, with regard to um, outpatients and so on, having to go into hospital diagnostic and radiology departments and so on to have investigations done. And I'm just throwing out a loud um, PS. In many other countries, you have what is called, or what are called standalone diagnostic services. Many of us would have seen that they go to the US, for example, and so on. So I'm just thinking in terms of moving forward, because we would all agree that diagnostic imaging services, uh, the future, play a very important part in making diagnosis and ensuring current treatment. Whether in the ministry's vision there is any 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 thought being given to having what, what is known or what is called standalone diagnostic services, where you just go to that facility and you have your non-emergency service done. To you, Madam Chair, if I can ask, um, yes, for his thoughts on, on, on this. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. 
Remember that's definitely something that we can look at. Um, we can explore that that opportunity with the feasibility of doing something like that. So it's it's a welcome suggestion that we will definitely look at at the ministry. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask the the CEO of the North Central Regional Health Authority. I see you all have a, uh, an equipment, nuclear medicine. Um, what does this machine do? I see it's one. You have it as its frequency of use high, but it is not functional. So one, I, I want to know what it does. Um, if it is something that is high frequency, I guess it's something that you you um, use often, it speaks for itself. And how long it has not been functional, what um, you've done to make up for that efficiency and when would it become functional? I'll speak to Chair, the, the um, functionality of the equipment. The, the problem is that that became very complicated in that the end of the life cycle of the equipment, um, it, it has exceeded its life cycle already by, fa by a few years. The intention though is, so what we've done is we've engaged the suppliers to determine what is the feasibility of doing enhancement or improvements on the equipment. We recently received a report that indicated that it is. It may not be feasible to do so, um, so that our next action within the next fiscal would be to procure that type of equipment. The usage of the or the potential usage and the other um, and the opportunity cost and certainly the other alternative treatment. Um, I'd leave up to the. I'd want to defer to the DOH, Doctor Ojuro. Thank you very much, um, CEO. Chair, through you. So uh, with regards to the, the, the nuclear medicine, we usually, is a gamma camera that I usually use mostly for thyroid cancer. So it's a way of monitoring and measuring the treatment that um, cancer patients receive and determining the amount of radiation they will get and follow up and care. So currently, some of our cancer patients now getting the service through EPP. So because the equipment is not functional, we will um, refer those who require it through EPP and they will get the service through EPP to, to get it to um, um, other providers outside. Okay, so um, it, it means that this is done through outsourcing. If that's what I understand. So not, not outsourcing in terms of uh, RHA engaging to outsource, but through a system that was referred to earlier, where people who cannot afford, we, we refer them to the EPP program at the ministry, and then, and then they will get the service delivered. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. Now, um, I, I think maybe this is a question for the PS, in terms of when we ask about the cost of the service says um, the answer came back. We asked what was the average cost per patient to utilize each diagnostic imaging service. And what we were told is market rates. And we really want to know what market rate means, um, how is it arrived at? Um, and, and after you answer that, then you could tell us about this costing exercise study that is to be undertaken and the scheduling of it. Sure, thank you, yeah. Madam Chair. So, so in terms of the market rate, it will basically be looking at, at what is the, the price out there. So one of the CEOs mentioned, getting the quotations, and then looking at what is that average cost out there. So that's what market rate speaks to. In terms of the specific question about what is the cost of the services, that, that um, our, our second part of the answer sort of address that in terms of the respective RHEs, you'd have to actually cost the various inputs at each RHE to get a sense of what is the actual cost of that service. So for example, an MRI in San Fernando may not cost the same, the actual cost I'm talking about as an MRI in, in North Central because of different factors, infrastructure, 
human resource, um, HRP equipment. So, so there's, a, there's a science behind costing of services, and, and that is what we are going to be doing in this fiscal year. Uh, we're looking to cost some of those specific services to get a sense of why there'll be differences in the cost. You want to ensure there's some, some consistency in a, in, in a broad range. So the cost is not too far out of what one average to another, right? So that, that costing study, that exercise, will give us that sort of detail. Okay, so the cost and exercise would be what is your for your in-house capability only, or also for your outsourcing capability, um, outsourcing needs. No, that that be for your in-house capability. So like I said in-house in capability. In-house, yes, in-house. And would that lead to then a rationalization of the services? Because remember, my understanding is that really each regional health. Authority could service one point one point four. Right. So it would lead to I don't want to say necessarily to lead to a rationalization. What it would look at is ensuring there's some sort of um, standardization as far as possible of the cost of that cost. So as I said, while there be differences between two RHs and their, their inputs to those to the cost of those services. If one is, I'm just using random figures here, Madam Chair. If one is a thousand dollars and one is two hundred dollars for the same service, clearly they're, they're going to look at that a little deeper to understand what's causing that. So that is what we're going to be looking at. So that that would ideally give you um, value for money and cost effectiveness, which we spoke about when we started the session. That is, that is your cost effectiveness within the system in the in house services. Okay. So at the end of the day, um, at the end of this exercise, the hope is that there would be a sort of margin, okay, an acceptable variance um, based on what your survey would have revealed, your study would have revealed, okay, so that you could be sure that the cost then in each regional health authority is within that margin. That's correct. I couldn't say that okay. myself. And, and when does the, the exercise begin and end? I see it's uh, 2022, but you no, know, that's 12 months. Yeah, so so we hope, and, and I say we hope because um, we do have COVID and that shows everything out, but uh, the intention is to start in first quarter of calendar 2022, which is second quarter of fiscal 2022, which is the January to March period. I, I don't have the information as of how long it will take. I can get that to the committee um, subsequently. Okay, and um, I, I'll be grateful for that. And um what are the factors of covid that will throw this exercise off um one would be the inputs because this would entail going into the RHAs, getting in there working with the persons and they have to get the various inputs because of the inputs the actual inputs themselves so so you have that 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 is in terms of our health providers already you know COVID and everything else as I said, it's not an exclusive, it's just a factor that might affect the duration of the exercise, yeah. not the study. So you, you may have manpower challenges to, yeah. to focus on this. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you could give us an idea of the length of time and keep us posted with respect to when you start. Sure. That, okay. okay. All right. And I, I want to pose this to each of the CEOs because we spent a long time discussing waiting times. And I get the impression that um, in most cases, you get for um, the emergency and urgent cases, there, there really is no waiting time. Okay. But when we talk about challenges, we'd ask what are the challenges faced? In ensuring the availability and accessibility of diagnostic imaging services across the IRGs. And what we were told is increasing demand for imaging services resulted in increased waiting times. We got equipment downtime caused by unavailability of required parts. We got delays with picture archiving and communication systems and structural infrastructure. So I want to, to ask each of the CEOs to expand on each of these challenges, um, its relevance to their operations, and 
what sort of steps are being taken to address each one as it relates to their regional health authority. So maybe we could start with the Northwest Regional Health Authority. Chairman, if you could just point me to the page so I could address each one um, sure. point. Sure, see you, Bash. If you look at page five, question four at the top of page five. Um, okay, so with respect to the increase in waiting time, so that would be for certain modalities, for instance, as um, Member Bodo would have um, um, hinted at before, with respect to COVID, we would be, there would be an increase in terms of the mobile x-rays, etc. So while there are some increases in some modalities, there would have been decreases in other modalities of diagnostic services because of the reduction in outpatient clinics, etc. So as it relates to those particular modalities where there are increase in demand because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as we indicated with respect to the availability of our equipment, we do have redundancy. And um, in terms of ensuring that all our equipment that are required for those type of increased services do um, are functional at all times and try and prevent you know, any type of excessive downtime with respect to those type of, types of equipment. But and let I me ask something, Ms. Bash, one minute. But would, would it have affected the waiting time for people who were routine or not considered life-threatening or urgent? Uh, so, no, not necessarily. And um, I would bring, like, for instance, one example is with our CT scan machine. Now, with respect to have, uh, conducting scans on COVID patients, of course, once a COVID patient leaves the containerized unit, we have to um, perform sanitization on the equipment and in the environment, et cetera. So what we have done strategically to minimize that type of delays during the day, we have um, decided to schedule um, particular hours to deal with COVID patients. So, within, so every day within the hours of 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., we accommodate COVID patients. So we don't have to sanitize in between patients because they are COVID positive. So during that time, we try to um, to scan all COVID patients so we can do our regular sanitization to um, decrease delays. Of course, if there's an urgent need for a, a CT scan for a COVID positive patient, we will accommodate outside of those scheduled hours. So those are the type of strategies we are trying to implement with respect to decreasing delays that of um, equipment that are used for both COVID as well as regular non-COVID um, positive patients. But to answer your question, no, it hasn't really severely impacted in terms of regular patients accessing the, the service or the equipment that provides that service. Right, so with structural infrastructure be a challenge that affects you? So um, I can use the example of the CT machine, as I indicated before, um, because of our fire in the radiology department, our main CT machine is our container CT machine, which is a 16 slice. And originally that was our backup CT machine, but that has become our main CT machine because of the fire. So because it's in a container unit, yes, there are challenges in terms of maneuvering patients, et cetera. But of course we work around that um, in terms of, you know, trying our best to ensure that those type of um, issues do not um, severely impact the patient care. So that is one example of the infrastructural aspect. And it, with respect to our radiology department, we are on track to, um, to completing those repairs. As I say, the 128 CT slice machine is en route. And by the time that arrives, the, the infrastructure part of the department will be ready to receive that equipment. So we are working to improve those infrastructural challenges that we do experience at the Port of General Hospital. And do you have the issue with respect to picture archiving and communication systems? Yes, we yes. do have some and challenges. Could you, with could you, just before, in, in telling us that, could you tell us what is involved in this and how does it result in a delay? Um, well, I will 
in terms of what it is involved in it, I will ask Dr. Budram to speak to that technical part of the picture archiving system. But before he can, before he speaks to that, what I can say with respect to the challenges we have been experiencing with our parks, we are in communication with the present supplier to have an updated park system, and we are awaiting quotations for that presently. So I will pass you over to Dr. Budram, who can actually explain what is the picture archiving system and how it how it works with respect to providing that service to patients. Hi, good afternoon. So it's basically a system of using radiology. So well, the, the short name of it is, is called a PAX. So it's basically a system where images from all modalities, CTs, X-ray, ultrasounds, fluoroscopy, MRIs, they're all available in one common database it's basically an effective effectively tool so already i'll just kind of pull up images from current studies old studies we could report from those studies send back to print in patient can have access through through the system as well and we also use the system for scheduling of patients as well so it's basically an effectively tool that using a radiology department in order to report images and to well, basically schedule patients as well that's basically it's in a nutshell. So yours is not fully functional, or is it? So Madam Chair, present. Well, yes, Madam Chair, it is present. Um, presently functional. Um, as I said, we do experience some challenges, but our IT, um, our IT personnel do troubleshoot, and they are working with the supplier when we do have, you know, those type of technical issues. Uh, just to also add, Madam Chair, with respect to the MRI machine that we will be installing at St. James, we are also getting a PAX system, and we will be able to increase our um, or expand our PAX system with respect to um, what we are experiencing with Port of Spain. So that is also another aspect of the PAX system that we are improving on. So in terms of the delay, you will put that delay in terms of time that results from your challenge with the picture archiving and communication system. You will put that in terms of time as how long? A day? Two weeks? How does it I impact? Will, I will ask Dr. Budram to provide that response. Dr. Budram? Okay, so it seems we've lost Dr. Bujam and therefore see you if we could get that response in writing, please. Sure, Madam Chair, will do. Okay, um, can we therefore hear from the Eastern Regional Health Authority on these four challenges that have been identified and if that is applicable to East Regional Health and how do they meet with these challenges? All right, uh, Madam Chair, I'll ask um, Dr. Sasha Maraj from the hospital to respond. Afternoon, Chair and committee members again. Um, yes, we have noted that there's been an increase in demand. Um, for example, in our, ultra, our ultrasound service, um, there has been an increased demand for this, um, both within the inpatient and the outpatient population. One of the measures that we would have put in place is to introduce an additional evening session for the ultrasonography. Um, to aid with that waiting time. Similarly to what would have been expressed at Northwest in terms of patients who would, would present with respiratory associated illnesses for investigations, we've noticed an increase in demand for that service. Um, we've dedicated one of the portable x-ray services to the isolation areas to assist with that. In addition, um, our CT scanner, we've also used block appointments um, for patients who may have been highly suspicious of, let's say, COVID-19 versus our elective cases or other inpatient cases. Um, with respect to the equipment downtime, we've incorporated that into our tendering process for the uptime guarantee and our preventative and corrective maintenance schedules as well. Um, we really haven't experienced much delays with the picture archiving and communication system or PAC system. Um, with respect to the structural and infrastructural issues of note, our new mammography unit um, is being installed and there would have been some retrofitting 
that would have been required for that. But we do have an estimated date of December 27 for commencement of that service. Just a, a, a quick addition. Um, for most of the equipment, um, they would not have been retrofitting because, for example, uh, we've put X-ray into the Toko community in primary care and uh, we built purpose built an X-ray suite for that. Mammography is going also into there. Um, well, of course, you have Mayaro and Rio Claro providing uh, imaging services, basic imaging services, as well as ultrasound services, so that um, this putting out into primary care helps us to alleviate some of the demands within the hospital setting because we've pushed the service further out into primary care also. Thank you very much, Mr. Suefa. And, and therefore, could we now ask the CEO of the Southwest Regional Health Authority to speak to that issue? Sure, thank you, Chairman. Um, I would say, yes, there's, been, there's a consistently high demand for services. Um, we do have high throughput. Um, in terms of the increased wait in times, with the exception of the MRI as an age equipment, we did have some challenges last year um, with some downtime, but that has since been rectified, um, but it has created some backlog. So we look to our partner, RHAs, when their MRIs come online to assist us. But several of the other services, though, within the last year and a half, we have seen a decrease in wait in times, and it's due to multiple factors. Yes, we have um, better utilization in some of our periphery DHS, and we have done some internal quality assurance work with our operator times. Just paid attention to some fine details, turnaround time, if you're coming from the from the ward to the um, to the to the X-ray service, and and little little things that have improved the the streamlining of speed of processing. So therefore, um, we have had decreased waiting times, particularly with the CT and some of the ultrasounds and so forth. Um, equipment downtime, uh, we have redundancy, most of the equipment, so as I said, the, the main downtime um, was the MRI, but most other services we have considered improve over the last year and a half. We do have, we do have delays in the current picture archiving system, and to quickly refer to an earlier question, I, I got the information because that is one of our PSIP projects that we are due to complete by the end of this month, where we have um, um, purchased or procured a, a new picture archiving system that is in the final stages of, of installation and to replace the current one that did have some challenges with respect to connectivity and speed of processing and so forth. And um, in terms of the structural infrastructure, um, as an age hospital, um, some of the areas, yes, are repurposed, but um, the science and technology to create the ambient environment and space, humidity, temperature, um, and so forth, all of that is accounted for. So with the exception of point 14 hospital, it's a brand new hospital with a diagnostic suite there. And the DHS and the San Fernando General, um, as, as an age hospital, the equipment there, yes, is in, rep in repurposed areas, but it generally, if you're going to upgrade over the years, it's in the same area, just refurbished to match the technology. I don't see that as a rate limiting um, factor. So that summarizes it, but with your permission, Chairman, just allow Dr. Amiral to just state if he would like to add anything of relevance to these four issues. I'll just try to capture it in a summary way, but he's the head of the department. Yes, Dr. Amiral. Thanks, yeah, thanks CEO. I think uh, you've covered it quite well. Um, just to add, in addition to the infrastructure, one of the issues and challenges that we have had in the Southwest uh, region will be that of the human resource component. And this will relate to both the levels at the consultant radiologist with, who will be responsible for reporting and at, the technic, and at the technician level. So these will be our radiographers, general purpose radiography. And in particular, we do have a serious challenge at, in the Southwest. We currently just have, we are operating with just two MR techs. So that limits the actual service that we can give. These, our current service operates seven to three. We've tried to do extended hours, um, but again, that component I think would probably add to our uh, long waiting times, in particular, the modality of MRI. We're doing pretty good with all the other modalities. I'm really proud to say that ultrasound, we have a walk-in service. And we do, Jen, we do turn around our approximately 30,000 uh, procedures per year. 
and that's pretty good. Um, so other than the HR component, um, I think, you know, basically we seem to be on track. Might I ask now the CEO of the North Central Regional Health Authority? Chairman, with regard to the, the first issue, which is the increase in demand, we've noted an increase, uh, similarly, an increased demand for sonography, ultrasounds. We, um, we've engaged our challenge at the root cause. Um, it tended to be obstetrics and gynae requests that came via the communities via primary care. Um, and we've noted that the more junior the doctors, the more the more likely they were to request ultrasounds. Um, so what we did was we engaged specialist physicians um, led by Professor Basau, who just received his, um, the order of the Human Bird. The Human, yeah. Are you, are you hearing? Are you hearing? Yes, we, yes, hear. we are. Yeah. So basically, um, that has decreased the number of ultrasound requests that we've gotten from the communities. Um, so we've managed to move our um, our waiting for ultrasound, our waiting time for ultrasound from from nine months to six months for the non-urgent elective. Um, um, we're engaging that. the The other aspect of our medium and long term planning for for that was in, uh, involved the Arima General Hospital, as you know that was commissioned, and we engage that that those institutions to, and, and Cuba Hospital to be able to address a lot of those backlogs until, well, of course, COVID intervened. Um, so the specialist intervention at the periphery is in fact working for us um, so that the, the types of requests that come in tend to be um, the urgent ones that we could deal with immediately. Um, particularly because a specialist is on hand in the community, uh, an obstetrics or gynae specialist. And, and, and as I said, that is working. The equipment downtime, um, we've engaged two tiers of, of, of intervention for that. One is the redundancies in the system. We currently have um, redundancies for CAT scan and so on, and, and basically MRI if we include now Arima General Hospital. So, so it would have been Eric Williams, Arima General Hospital, and certainly um, Coover, Gen Coover multi-training facility. Um, but so there are inherent re redundancies at Eric Williams and, and at the, um, the Arima General Hospital. In addition to that, though, the PPM schedules are strict in terms of our, our management of those PPM schedules. Um, we have what we call essential and required improvement. Our PPM schedules for critical equipment and diagnostic equipment are, 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 are central to, our, to uh, are being monitored directly by the regional coordinator and certain regional coordinator, Biomed, and ultimately the CO, and then the CEO's office, and then the quality um, committee of the board, and then subsequently the board. So we're, we're pretty on top of that. Our downtime generally for equipment, and that is for unplanned downtime, is less than, than 2%. So we've managed to wrestle that into place. And as I said, um, we have brother and sister RHEs that intervene when, and, and readily, yeah, we've, we, that's just a call from a, from a clinician to say someone is coming across to have something at Port of Spain or at, at San Fernando. So there, there's that communication and synergy that is now taking place in the system. So the downtime really doesn't have a net impact. Um, but, the, but again, the downtime has moved. If you note from in the past, there, was this, there were these newspaper things that, that would have said that downtimes would have been, um, Port of Spain is down and, and Eric Williams is down, but that, that no longer exists. Um, as frequently. So ours is, is about 2%. Um, in addition to that, the delays in the picture archiving system. We have two tier of redundancies for our picture archiving system. One is the normal, the PACS, which is at brand, PACS RIS. That happens on two levels. 
one level of the PAX is the actual imaging or the actual transfer of the images so that a doctor or a clinician could see an image somewhere, whether it's within the hospital or remotely. Um, and that is one aspect of it. The other is the reporting aspect of it, that the doctor or radiologist or consultant, as, as, as Ms. Batelmi would have mentioned, could then go in and look at the, the image and give the impression or report on those images. Um, so it's, it's, it's multi-tiered. However, we have we use two systems. One is OSIRIS, which is a contingency system, but that is predominantly image-wise. So worst case scenario, we can then we could look at those images um, throughout the system. And then we have the, the traditional PAX RIS, which is grounded at, at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences complex. The Arima General Hospital came with a very new system called VPRO. Um, that system has multi-tiers of possibilities in terms of both reporting um, and, and certainly imaging transfers. The, the, our, our IT department has managed to be able to facilitate the transfer of images from the Arima General Hospital back and forth to Cora, Kuva, Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, so that images can be seen throughout all of those facilities back and forth. So it's, it's basically that the image can be seen. The reporting is another issue that we are soon to address by engaging to expand VPRO across the RHE. The, the net effect of expanding VPRO, as we've had some discussions this week, with the PS and, and, and um, the, the CEO of Southwest, because they're the Southwest's um, Point Fortin Hospital came with that same package. It means that pretty soon, within the next three, four months or so, we can be speaking to our images and, 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 and reporting could speak, and that's, that's it in the emerging future, can be speaking to Point Fortin and, and, and True, and so that if that image is generated there, we could engage that in any one of our facilities here. That is, those are some of the medium and long term plans that we have. Um, in terms of, so, so that for parks, we did have a downtime um, because it's a very old system, I think 20 years or so, 15 or 20 years. We did have some downtime, but we, we, had, we, we had some contingencies in place, as I said, the, the um, OSIRIS and, and for imaging and certainly for reporting and scheduling, we would have used an, a home-based system that Mr. Lutchman and his team would have created the very day that, that as, as a contingency. Um, in terms of the structural infrastructure, um, well, the structural need, um, needs, we, um, there is a, there's a demand, there's a, a need for sonographers and echocardiographers um, within the system. Um, that, that, is a, that, that, that is a limiting factor. Um, whilst, we, yeah, whilst we want to, to, to do more of those, the availability of, of that category of staff, trained staff within the system is limited. We, we, we basically need to have more more sonographers trained and simultaneously um, echo in particular personnel trained. And that's, that's, that's where we are, Madam Chair. Okay, so um, in, in terms of two of the RHAs spoke with respect to um, human resource limitations. Um, uh, and P.S. is that solved by training of existing or is it that these are as uh, competencies to be higher? Madam Chair, I would maybe let Mr. Taylor answer that. That's, I'm, I don't have the answer. So maybe Mr. Taylor could, could help me here. Um, in relation to sonographers, um, I, I really can't, can't speak to that, but in relation to um, biomedical engineers and technicians. I think that was the earlier issue raised. 
Um, and it was mentioned that the University of the West Indies and UTT, well, actually now just the University of the West Indies, do train engineers. Um, um, and, you know, they are available both for private sector and public sector engagement. Though someone coming out of the university with a degree in biomedical engineering still must um, be molded and trained by the RHA to meet their particular needs. And the probably the similar thing happens with sonographers. I, I think it's uh, UTT produces sonographers. Um, again, it has to do with there is a demand in the private sector as well as the public sector. So it, there are market forces at play here in terms of um, getting access to those resources and developing them. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Thomas, so if, if there are resources, what uh, restricts you, inhibits you from acquiring resources? Is it a budgetary issue? What, 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 what? Yeah, UT does not provide training for sonographers. There are no sonographers. There's no surplus of sonographers in the system. It's an international training requirement, particularly for specialties like pediatric sonography and, and, and MRI. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we basically, the, the training does not exist locally for sonographers, in particular, electro cardiologist electrocardio echocardiographer echo uh, echocardiographers uh, similarly there's no training here there's no training in Trinidad and Tobago okay so there, there really is a shortage locally that's what I understand yes there is we've 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 attempted to, to um engage and, and pillage the private sector to see if we could get as well. It, 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 it really, they're in high demand and the, 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 our, 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 our remuneration is not competitive to begin with. Um, so it's a, it's, a com, it's a combination of, of availability and accessibility. All right, so uh, I, I think from what I understand, it appears that most of these challenges, which were identified, I think it's by the Ministry of Health, PS Ministry of Health, maybe you're doing such a great job that your, your RHAs don't really see these challenges generally as, as, applicable, as applicable to them. I mean, no one really spoke about the retrofitting as opposed to being built for the intended purpose. In fact, the person who spoke about that, about structural infrastructure, which would have been um, Eastern Regional Health Authority, spoke in a positive light in terms of their having built, purpose-built facilities. So that um, I'm not sure, therefore, how these challenges were, were identified. So, so, Madam Chair, um, if I may, so these, these would have been historical challenges, but as the Irishes have said, and I mean, we must acknowledge that the CEOs and the Irishes have been doing tremendous work to address these challenges. And that's why we're, we are where we are, and it's an ongoing process. Um, it's an ongoing journey, but they have addressed these challenges to a significant degree. All right, so I, I just want to find out in terms of uh, the accessing of the diagnostic imaging equipment. There was a question regarding the number of patients who have access um, to a regional health authority on an annual basis. That is 11 four. And um, each regional health authority has given a, a number. In the Northwest Regional Health Authority is 123,270 persons, unlike in the North Central Regional Health as many as 298,200 persons. What I want to know is how do these numbers, these were the people who have actually accessed your services, 
how do these numbers uh, compare with the actual demands made on you? So if this, this number represents 100%, it represents 50%, with respect to each regional corporation, regional, sorry, health authority. So see, nobody's volunteering. Let me, let me start with Southwest Regional Health Authority. I'm seeing 150,800 persons accessed on an annual basis. I take it, would that be the last last calendar year, the last fiscal year? Yeah, that would be for the that would be for the last um, year period requested for the report. So um, from where I sit, we look at the outcomes. So therefore, since most of the services, as we said before, are walking, all emergency taking care of walking is within a couple of weeks. I think for most of the services, we are matching the demand. Um, we mentioned the ex the outlier with the with the MRI. Um, the thing is, in terms of the, the in terms of the demand, I would again refer to I would refer to the director of health. Um, in terms of giving a supplemental to my answer, because yes, I think overall we meet the demand, but but there are clinical considerations in terms of what type of tests you do. Some patients may require more than one test and so forth. So you might find, even though you might meet a demand per test modality, some patients, depending on the complexity of their thing, may need more than one diagnostic and depending on the complexity. And of course, there is still a trial system to determine who gets what test. So with your permission, the director of health could stop so just, be just before we move off, see you, I'm, I'm not sure one, I got the period. So is this the calendar year 2020, when you talk about an annual basis, would this be an average over some a number of years? I'm not sure how to read this figure in terms of on an annual basis? Or would have this been a fiscal fiscal year 2020, 2021? I just want to know what period this 150,800 persons really to. Okay, I will confirm that, but we normally report in fiscal year. So we, will, we would normally report the activities for, for a given fiscal year, because we do have public reporting requirements. All right. So this would be 150,800 persons access the, di the um, diagnostic imaging equipment for the fiscal year 2020, 2021. Correct, yes. Correct. And your, you would pass on the response with respect to whether this was 100% of your demand. Yes, and I'm saying largely yes, but my head of department can, can elaborate. Sorry, my director of health. Yes, good afternoon. So the for most of the modalities, it represents 95% uh, and uh, upward for the MRI and the echocardiography. Um, it would represent probably about 50% of our demand. All right. And therefore, in respect to the 50% of the demand, this would also relate to the persons who you would have referred to other, other brother or sister regional health authorities. Do you count that as yours or are they counted in the regional health authority in which the service was delivered? So for the last fiscal year, we actually only accessed fewer than 25 uh, studies uh, done at the and CRH, all, all the other services were, were done at Southwest RH. We, we did not have to outsource any. All right. And, and if, if, if you didn't have to outsource any, why then you could only meet 50% of your demand? So with respect to the MRI, we had a significant downturn for the year because of machine uh, issues that needed repairs and parts needed to come in and there were delays in, in, in um, getting those parts into the country. And then there's a worldwide shortage of helium. The machine needs helium. So there were delays in helium. So there were several months when the machine, the service could not be delivered. 
And as far as the echocardiography equipment, the, well, the demand is, is large for the service, but we also have a shortage of the, uh, of the technicians um, to operate the machinery. Okay, so that would be at the Southwest Regional Health. That's right. But, but what, what, I, what I understood before is that there was an arrangement amongst the regional health authorities that if you couldn't meet for whatever reason a, a demand, it, they would be then outsourced to a sister one. So what I'm trying to find out is for whatever good reason, if you could only meet 50% of your demand for MRIs, and you're also saying less than 25, not percent, less than 25 persons will outsource. Why not the remaining 50%? Okay, Why so they would outsource? When, by the time we made arrangements to start um, doing outsourcing at North Central, the, and the service started up, they, they at that time converted to a COVID hospital, so that, that Kuva. So that came to an end. And then our, when our machine came up, we started to um, create, uh, run additional type of mid, mid provisions for the people who have, a, who have been postponed due to the machine not being available to get them done as a priority. So we prioritized those persons and we had in fact a, a, a program to try to clear up those as much as possible. So in, as far as we could try to manage, we were, back, we were reducing the backlog as soon as we could. And then we had some further challenges with the machine. Okay, but 50% is 50%. And you're saying so, 50%. So, um, wait, wait, I am a little confused. Okay, what you're saying is within a fiscal year, you only satisfied 50% of your demand for MRIs. There may have been delays for whatever reason. Um, you, you outsource to then try to clear up whatever backlog, but you still ended up with treating with only 50%. That, that is what, I, unless I misunderstand. And therefore, what I'm trying to find out is the untreated 50%, how has that been dealt with? So that's, that is, you would see the evidence is that our waiting list is, is up to December 2022. So we have um, created a, I mean, a waiting list. Now, internationally, the waiting time for an MRI can be up to eight months for a non-urgent MRI. So the, the issue is also that other RHS do not have the capacity as well for MRI services to take up that, um, you know, when we are down for that length of time to take it up. At one time, the Kuva Hospital had started up doing MRIs for us, but then the, with, the, with the switching over of the Kuva Hospital to COVID, that had to come to an end. So there's not much capacity for us to do um, a, a large bulk of MRIs externally. So would I be correct then in drawing the conclusion that COVID plus your operational or, um, or your functional capabilities of your machines would have negatively impacted your ability to meet your demand for MRI services. Yes. Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, Eastern Regional Health Authority, yours is 52,841 persons who would have accessed your services. And, and, and therefore, similarly, in terms of would this have been 100% of your, your demand or what percent of your, your demand um, would have been left so, on net. Let me just say that um, it's instructive to look at the waiting times and that points us in a direction yep. so that when you hear that you, you're you able to walk in and get an, a, a basic x-ray, that will tell you that we are meeting the demands fully. Um, our waiting times are short for CT. 
all right? Um, the major areas where you will have challenges would be the areas particularly of ultrasonography, all right? Echo also. And because we are doing only inpatient echoes, for example, at the San Grande Hospital. And it's, it's an area that we need to identify for urgent support, I think, nationally, because uh, we were talking about the, the availability of sonographers and so on. And for me, particularly because I'm an advocate in terms of primary care, and I think we need to have more and more ultrasound services out in primary care so as to reduce the burden that would exist at the hospital level, <clears throat> even in terms of our CNCDs, the uh, chronic non-communicable diseases, the hypertensions, etc. We need to have like the echoes and so on out in primary care also, mm -hmm. so that it's it's very important at this stage that we take note of the fact that the areas, the particular areas that are not, we're not meeting the demands would be linked to the areas in particular where the human resource may not be available. And perhaps we need to prioritize. And certainly in the ERH, we've been trying our best to, to locate sonographers, echo people and so on. Um, the other issues I think uh, that, that are reflected are not for us because uh, the MRI, we don't have that problem. We don't have an MRI yet. But certainly um, once the, the other regions, and I take the point that was made by uh, Southwest, that the fact is that the surplus MRI capacity that we have is in fact located in the, the COVID institutions right now, like Point and Arima and Coover. So that I think would be uh, uh, alleviated with the passing a little bit of COVID, those facilities will become more available. So what I'm trying to find out is, um, and, and maybe thanks so much for that explanation that you're giving. If I were to ask you, just as you could give me a number of persons you were able, were able to access your services, would you be able to give me a corresponding number for persons who you were unable? Yes, we should. To um, Dr. Maraj, what do you have any? And, and see, what I will ask, and I will ask all the, all the regional health authorities to give me that. And, and that could come as a question, as an answer in writing. No problem. And, and, no. Right? And, and that goes out to all. And similarly, because the, the PS had initially, in, in one of his responses, spoke about um, information being given, data being presented from the RHAs to sort of justify different um, equipment being acquired. Okay? So, I, I, so that the equipment that you have in your RHAs um, differ and it may be specific to certain trends um, on demands that you all would have seen happening in your particular RHA. In terms of these numbers that you've shown me, do you have data disaggregated by age, sex, um, district, within your regional health authority? Well, well Chair, we, we do have the data on mm -hmm. the persons who, we, who requested an appointment, et cetera. We will have to disaggregate them by, by the categories, the demographics, and so on subsequently, and we can do that. The other intervention or, or this discussion, I think the other engagement that I think we, sh we should have is the, the issue of, of, of value based that, um, that whilst there's a, a percentage, for example, we have a 20% of persons that, that are rolled over. The outcomes is, is in terms of that value based approach to healthcare implies that we we basically engage those emergency and urgent patients um, 
immediately. So that those eighty percent of persons who seventy seventy eighty percent of persons who come into the institutions and require care now, require care for immediately improved outcomes, they receive do, that care. And certainly, mm -hmm. those 20%, whilst the perception is that everyone has an emergency, even if you, it is that you sprained your toe, the, the need for the x-ray of, of your toe, is that we really? will tear that in terms of order of priority later down. And that is more likely to roll over. So in terms from an outcomes-based perspective, from a, a value-based perspective, we engage those persons who require the particular diagnostic testing on time, just in time. So you come into the emergency department, you had a stroke, you need to have a CT scan, you get that. And that happens throughout. If you're at a facility and, and, they re and we go past the three or four tiers of redundancy that they have at, let's say, Port of Spain or vice versa or at Eastern, we either, even if it comes to borrowing an ambulance, we bring that patient across and that patient receives that care immediately. So in terms of an outcome value-based perspective, the share need of that 70, 80% of persons who come into the emergency department, and those are the general needs, they receive that. The, the persons who have though, that 10, 15, 20% who require to have an x-ray because they need hurtinia and so on, those are tiered in terms of the priority in the sequence of priority later down in the, in the, within the sequence of priority. Okay, so understood. But of course, you know, within the 70%, there would always be a percent that for some reason doesn't happen. And, and those are the ones we would hear about. Okay, and, and, and that's why we're trying the data must speak for itself. What, what I am hearing is conclusions, which I don't doubt. It's just the data that supports it. Okay, now um, what, what I want to ask is, does any of the regional health authorities have a uh, PET scan machine? I see CT, I, I, I just figured that I was wondering if a CT machine is the same as a PET scan machine. Maybe the PS can answer that. Sure, sorry, yeah, sorry yeah, Madam yeah. Chair. So short answer, no Madam Chair, the, one of the Irishers has a PET CT scan uh, machine. Okay, and uh, what I wanted to find out is that in, in terms of our um, our Vision 2030 document, right? One of them is putting people first, and I see on the um, goal three, which refers to health, that we all talk about our citizens will be healthy. And if I want to ask if a PET scan machine is considered um, necessary or justifiable in our healthcare system, having regard to the incidence of, of cancers and um, the non-communicable diseases. Sure. Um, maybe Madam Chair, let us see. I will um, just respond to that question, please. Right. Um, thank you, Pierce. So there is a role for PT, PT, CT scan in this service. Um, I want to refer to maybe the, the head of radiology from Southwest to first lay out what is the role of a PT, CT versus a CT scan in the treatment of patients. So what are the clinical indications? And then we could go a little bit further into the vision of the ministry. Um, so if the head of department from Southwest or the radiologist from Northwest, I saw present as well, could give that detail first, and then we could go a little bit more into the vision so that the public could understand its clinical role. Thank you, CMO. Through you, Chairman Dr. Amaral. 
Okay, um, right, great. So a PET scanner basically is an integral part um, of scanning and management of our oncology patients. It's basically a functional scanner that looks for activity in terms of tumor, a primary tumor, and spread or metastases. So it is actually quite a valuable tool that is used to, to monitor progress during treatment. Okay. Um, so yeah, building on, on that um, short summary, what we can suggest, I know there's a PT, PT at least one, um, PET CT scan machine in the country. So as in keeping with our normal services, what we can do is have a, a partnership or outsourcing through the RHAs for that service. We have been getting some of those tests done through um, and PS could go into the relationship in terms of the how, um, the rationale for having free scans at that particular center. But we are doing some PET, CT scans through an arrangement with a private provider at this point in time. Um, but there's always room for growth and expansion of that um, service based on clinical needs. Yes. So, um, so as CMO said, Madam Chair, the RHAs do refer persons for PET CTs at that private provider um, as required. Um, I mean, there'd be clinical, clinical criteria that they use. We would have negotiated with the provider uh, a standard rate for all the RHAs. I don't have that figure in front of me. I'm sorry, I can share that subsequently. Um, but that, that is what currently obtains. As, as CMO said, based on the, the need for, for that sort of diagnostic, Technology, if the cost, and we have to look at it, we have to look, do that analysis. If, if, it, if the cost is, is um, cost benefit analysis shows that it makes more sense to have it in house, meaning within the, the public sector, we will definitely look at that. But it might be that at this point, it is more cost effective to, to outsource that service. Okay, so um, until we do the cost benefits analysis, we won't be sure. Um, yeah, maybe I can just maybe let Dr. Smith talk, touch a bit more on this. He has been working on, on, on oncology in terms of that part of it. So maybe Stuart can help me a bit here. Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you, P.S. Um, good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, the issue of the PET CT is a delicate one in the sense that the mere fact that we have an arrangement with the private sector where we are outsourcing services, the need for an additional um, machine within the population of 1.4 million and the burden of cancer disease, and given the clinical indication as indicated by Dr. Amaral, it may, it may all be a moot point at this point in time to continue the discussion. So what we have to say as a country is answer the question, are the PET CT needs of the population being adequately met by having one PET CT and cyclotron facility in the country? That's the first question. And the second question, if the answer to the first is correct, is has the Ministry of Health made sufficient arrangements with that private sector organization to provide access to the public that access public oncology services in the public sector so that they can have adequate access and availability to that machine and that therapy to provide proper treatment, diagnosis, and care. And I think the answers to both those questions at this point in time from my position would be yes. So I would say we would continue. Should that situation change, there would be a need to do further analysis. Okay, so that I, I, I would ask, when does that begin? That analysis based, that cost benefit analysis that the PS spoke about based on what you have just said. Um, and, and therefore I, I leave the, the PS to respond to that to us, which you can do in writing. Sure, Madam Chair. Sure. So, might I ask the members of the committee, Member Bartholomew, 
Member McClashy, are there any other questions you would like, like to ask? And if not, I think, Member Bodo, you had indicated that you are finished with your line of questioning. Member McClashy? No, Madam Chairman, I am okay. I have no questions for the task. Okay, and Member Bartholomew? I'm also okay, Madam Chairman. Okay, I think Dr. Bodo, you may have had a change of mind. Yeah, sorry, Madam Chair. I just, I just wanted to, um, just to follow up a bit on the, the, the very important issue that you raised with, with regards to the unmet demand by the RHAs when you analyze, and we got some perspective on the figures. Um, and, you know, I, I foresee a situation where, for whatever reasons and so on, and because of COVID, that we are going to have this um, big waiting list for these diagnostic services. And, and maybe we might need a national plan to treat with this. So I don't know if I can invite PS again to, to look at this because this may have to be treated, you know, in a holistic manner, in a national manner. So if I could invite PS again to, to look at what might be the ministry's plans to treat with this when the when the pandemic is you know is easing a bit. And also just to follow up on the issue with the um the the shortage of what I would term diagnostic imaging technicians for whatever reason. And to ask, and maybe this could be provided in writing, Madam Chair, PS3, Madam Chair, with regards to, for each RHA, um, the established positions for these diagnostic imaging technicians, be it MRI technician or radiographers or whatever, um, and with regards to the, so the established positions and the vacancies. Um, just to close off and asking PS to share his views as to how we can go forward um, with recruiting more of these technicians because it, it's obvious that in some instances the shortage of technicians in the particular areas might be a really limiting factor. Um, so I will close with that, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, with regard to the, the, the question of recruitment of those professionals that you mentioned, Member, I think one of the Things we, we we have to do, which we which we do, would be to have a conversation with our local training institution, UE, UPT, USC, the Costats, to well one develop a plan and develop to train a particular cohort that would meet our our in, immediate needs and also going forward, um, that our future needs. Now, of course, that is not a short-term solution that is more medium-term because they have to develop the curriculum and put that in place and all of that. So that's medium-term. Uh, short-term, it would have to be, if there isn't anything in country, we'd have to look outside the country. I mean, if, if there isn't anything, anybody available within the country, we'd have to look outside as a short-term measure because that is not sustainable. Ideally, you want to train your locals, train your nationals and have that in, in country capacity. So that is the way we would... Uh, have to approach that particular matter. With regard to your uh, question about the unmet demand and your, your suggestion about the diagnostic uh, facility, that would be something we look at. I think we need to look at both of those together, holistically, in terms of our diagnostic imaging net, national network across the public sector. So right now you have the different facilities. Is that sufficient? Is there need for something different? So that's, that, that's a piece of what we'd have to do to look at it holistically. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Buru, is that it? Yes. Okay, so I, I just want to ask each CEO in turn to, um, if they wish, if they can say to the committee what they think, in which way they think we can help them to achieve greater service delivery in terms of diagnostic imaging services which they offer. Chair, I, I would like to reiterate, Chair, the, the need for, for training and development for, son, for sonographers and particularly for echocardiographers. Um, it, even if it means um, the sponsorship of, of appropriate persons 
to go out there and train. It, I think it takes, we, our investigations implied, it takes two years. So within two years, if we get a cadre of those personnel and we bond them for possibly five years or so um, and start engaging a turnover of that particular, particularly the ECHO, um, we'd be in a, a much better place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to just support um, what Mr. Thomas is saying there because um, I think, you know, we talk about the CNCD revolution and so on. And in fact, and we talk about maternal and child health and so on as, as key areas that we need to beef up in, the, in, in this service. And I think sonography and echocardiography are very, very critical in supporting that because more and more we need to start moving these services out into primary care and encountering these things earlier so that we can manage them. Because if we don't do that, we will continue to have the burden of care going into the hospitals rather than being able to intercept these things on the outside in primary care, head them off at the pass, as they would say in the old Westerns, and, um, you know, I th so I just want to agree that really training is, is critical in those particular areas. And I want to re-emphasize that if you look at the waiting times in some of the other modalities, it will tell you that we are, in fact, achieving in those modalities a, a good, you know, a good uptake. The other thing is that as you will find also that as you um, train and as you bring more sonography and sound services on, the demand will increase further there in that area so that it will tell you, you know, that we, we need these things even more. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we see you at the Southwest Regional Health. Yes, I too would like to echo my colleagues. Um, it's been a good experience in this committee, the, the, the precision root cause of technician grade training for use of the specialized equipment also, also applies to us with the echocardiography and well, you heard earlier with the MRI. Um, I do think that the that overall, despite the COVID pandemic, because for Soto that has been a reality, despite the COVID pandemic, we have been able to decrease waiting times based on the redundancy of the equipment, operator efficiency, um, Looking at the touch points, I always like to use the analogy of a racing around and it's the pit stop is where you will win the race. So we look at all the pit stops and we try to close gaps. Then we have had some measure of success. In terms of the committee, I think all RHS have stated that um, our outcomes are pretty good with um, X-ray, ultrasound and so forth. But note what was said earlier by the Ministry of Mr. Taylor, we do have a meta seven to 10 year cycle. Equipment is expensive. The earlier question was asked about aging equipment. So I think once you get the supplemental information that the committee has asked for, then it lends itself that over a certain period, looking at the country as a whole, each RHA within the tandem of their age life of equipment would need a significant input investment. I know the macroeconomics, but if we really want to do the diagnostic equipment, some equipment has to be changed out. And, and you ask by the metrics based on population size, equity, use of equipment and so forth. So once the Ministry of Health um, through the principal ministries or in a committee like this could, uh, could, could look and really um, determine and be satisfied with the justification that over a 10-year country history, different RHAs with the different equipment, some are capital change out, some an additional one. Bottom line, for example, listening to this, Southwest needs another MRI. That's the bottom line. So therefore, that helped with the committee as what I would suggest. But overall, I think listening to my colleagues and listening to my own team, um, I think we are, we are doing a pretty good job, but that would be the help I would say that the committee could consider, Chairman. Thank you very much, CEO. And the CEO for North West Regional Health Authority. Uh, good afternoon again. And I just want to um, share these sentiments of my colleagues. I think they've said it all because we all have similar challenges, especially with the technicians. So, you know, instead of belaboring the point, I will just refer to the comments made by my colleagues. Thank you. All right, so uh, I want to thank all the representatives and officials from the various regional health authorities. 
and also the PS and the officials from the Ministry of Health um, in engaging in this very important topic. I mean, um, if we have to meet our Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is good health and well-being, I think, you know, the diagnostics have to be early. And I think the diagnostic imaging services really help in um, early diagnosis and accurate diagnosis and also looking in terms of how treatment is advancing. So I, I want to say that in terms of our goals of reducing mortality from non-communicable diseases and reducing, I, I think the overall aim is to reduce by one third the premature mortality rate worldwide. I think this is a very important discussion that we've engaged in here. Um, I look forward to the additional information which has been promised. There are some other questions which the committee will send to you all in writing um, with the specific um, deadline date. I want to thank all healthcare professionals and all people engaged in healthcare for the, their resilience, their dedication, their commitment in the past two years in treating with the COVID-19 virus. Um, and um, I know it continues to be with us. I would also like to, in speaking to the general public, enlist them in doing the three Ws and also in availing themselves of the vaccines. Those are the tried and tested ways for us to come to grips with this pandemic that um, has us all in one way or the other being impacted. Again, I want to thank you all and wish you all a very good afternoon. Thank you to the members of the media who stayed with us and thank you to the members of the listening public. Pleasant afternoon. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Blessings all for a lovely Christmas season. Thank you. Stay safe, all. Recording stopped.